On November 27th, 1998, the Sega Dreamcast was released in Japan, succeeding the Sega Saturn. The Saturn, though deemed an abject failure in most markets, was a hit in its home country, thanks primarily to the system's robust library of quality arcade ports and visual novels. The Sakura Wars series was exceptionally popular, with both the first and second entry ranked among the top-selling games on the system. To put it into perspective, every one in 11 Japanese Saturn owners at the time also owned a copy of Sakura Wars 2, a game that came out only half a year before the Dreamcast's launch. Sega and Red Company were eager to repeat this success on the Dreamcast, leading to the creation of a studio known as Overworks in April 2000. Though their primary focus was to create Sakura Wars content, and boy did they, Western gamers might be more familiar with them for their other titles, such as Shinobi on the PS2, as well as a little Dreamcast and GameCube game by the name of Skies of Arcadia. Basically, if you saw this logo when starting up a game, you knew you were about to play a bona fide classic. Fun fact! Did you know that as of this recording, only one single game by Overworks has been ported to a system more modern than the GameCube? Thank you, Sega! The Dreamcast would see a deluge of Sakura Wars titles in the form of Hanagumi Taisen Columns 2, the Ogami Ichiro Funtoki fan disc, ports of the first two games, and the Sakura Wars Kinematron Hanagumi Mail email client, all leading up to Sakura Wars 3's release on March 22, 2001. This third mainline entry would see some dramatic changes in the series conventions. No longer would series protagonist Ichiro Ogami be protecting the peace in Imperial Tokyo, but rather in the city of Paris, France, halfway around the world, where players would get to know an almost completely new cast of characters. The move to next-gen hardware also came with a host of technical upgrades. No longer were scenes confined to tiny windows, Characters and backgrounds could now be full screen without borders. The same went for FMV video, which gameplay could transition to and from seamlessly. Well, okay, the transition was less noticeable on CRT displays, but nevertheless, faster loading made such things possible. What's more, battles went from grid-based isometric affairs with pre-rendered sprites to skirmishes in full 3D, in every sense of the term. Graphics, movement, and camera. Along with VMU bonuses and internet functionality, the game took advantage of every aspect of its hardware, positioning itself to be the definitive Dreamcast experience. Too bad it released about a week before the Dreamcast was discontinued. A mere nine days after Sakura Wars 3's release on March 22nd, the Dreamcast was discontinued worldwide on March 31st, 2001. Of course, this didn't come out of nowhere. Sega had announced they were exiting the hardware business and going third-party just two months earlier on January 31st, so the game came out on a platform whose fate had already long since been sealed. One of the very peculiar things about the Dreamcast, though, is how much life it had after death, so to speak. So even in the face of such a historic moment in gaming history, a sea change in the industry at large, Sakura Wars 3 performed exceptionally well. The game's original Dreamcast release sold over 300,000 copies, which at first doesn't sound all that great compared to the lifetime sales of the first two games' original Saturn releases. However, when factoring how many units the Saturn and Dreamcast sold in Japan, Sakura Wars 3 actually had the highest attach rate out of any game in the series. As a result, just like its Saturn forebears, it quickly became synonymous with the system. It's easy to see why, too, because Sakura Wars 3 is absolutely spectacular. I wasn't kidding with the whole bona fide classic thing earlier. When Western publications or YouTubers or whatever talk about the best Dreamcast games, they'll always list the usual suspects. Your Soul Calibers, your Fantasy Star Onlines, etc. Well, I'm here to flip the table and enter Sakura Wars 3 into the conversation. Just because most of y'all out there can't read any of it doesn't take away from the fact that this is one of the single best games on the Dreamcast, period. Perhaps I'll be vindicated with just a little more time, though, because as of this recording, there's a fan translation for Sakura Wars 3 in the works, verily as I speak. The team working on it only got started relatively recently, so it'll likely be some time before it's ready for everyone to play. But until that day comes, You've still got me here to summarize the game and translate the necessary bits for you. 
As usual, there will be huge spoilers, so proceed accordingly. Hopefully a more thorough look at this game will convince you that it is, indeed, one of the finest the Dreamcast has to offer, and that my opinion is objective fact. Seriously, pop the game in and you know immediately that it's something special. Thanks to the game's outstanding opening, Mihata no Motoni, with animation brought to us once again by Production IG. Believe me when I say that this is, bar none, one of the outright best opening cinematics in all of video games. I realize that's a lofty claim, and there's some stiff competition out there, but I'm being totally serious. Hell, don't just take my word for it. Look up any discussion of the best game OPs ever made on Japanese websites, and you'll almost assuredly see Sakura Wars 3 mentioned, if not being the very first post in the thread. Everything about it is practically flawless. The music, the animation, the pacing, the cinematography, every single aspect is on point. Following a bombastic beginning, the tone quickly turns dramatic as we are introduced to our new leading ladies in rapid succession. They only get a few seconds each, but in just that short span of time, they are perfectly, succinctly established. You immediately get to know each one of them and what their deal is. We're then shown the game's rogues gallery as they face off against our heroines in one immaculately animated shot after another. Then we hit the crescendo and roll right into the chorus, which never fails to give me chills. Thanks in no small part to this excellent fight scene with Ogami and his Kobu. Despite the CG in this sequence being over 20 years old at this point, it's aged spectacularly. Thanks to some excellent cell shading, snappy editing, and dynamic camera work with the camera whipping around without ever obfuscating the action or making you motion sick. We got some more insert shots of explosions, CG robot action, and dancing, before the staff at Production IG decide to go absolutely apeshit with some of the most immaculate sakuga I have ever seen in the form of these dresses during this can-can sequence. Then, as if that wasn't enough, it's immediately followed up by this shot of the camera going up the Eiffel Tower and doing a full 360 zoom of the main heroines at the top, animated on ones at 30 frames per second. Cap it off with a few more villain shots in the launch sequence for the bullet train, and bam, you have one of the best game intros ever made. Just as stunning now as it was the day it came out. Whereas the intro for Sakura Wars 2 gets me hyped, the intro for Sakura Wars 3 gives me goosebumps. Our story begins one month after the true ending of Sakura Wars 2. Imperial Navy Lieutenant Junior Grade Ichiro Ogami has finally arrived in Paris, France. His first order of business? Check in at the Japanese Embassy in the neighborhood of Montmartre to formally begin his assignment in the Foreign Personnel Exchange Program. Just outside the building, he meets his new boss, Norimichi Sakomizu. Despite his serious outward appearance, he's actually a fun-loving guy, and as such, he gives Ogami a ticket to the nearby expo to enjoy himself and get to know his new surroundings. Within seconds of arriving, Ogami almost gets hit by a car. <laughs> Ah, well, there's a problem right there. You got a lagomorph in the engine. Ogami tries to tend to the driver's wounds when. This is Erika Fontaine, a young nun in training from a local monastery. She's kind, caring, and dumber than a sack of bricks. Seriously, I'm not gonna mince words here. It's a miracle she even knows how to breathe. There's nothing going on up in that head of hers. That's not a complaint though, because Erika is an absolute delight and easily my favorite character in the entire series right after Koran. What can I say? I like him quirky. She quickly learns that Ogami is from Japan, revealing that she's something of a Japanophile, 
and just like most weebs, her preconceptions of Japan and its culture are wildly inaccurate. Not that Ogami is helping much here. She eventually has to get going, so she gives Ogami a flyer to the cabaret club she moonlights at, a place called Les Chat Noir, so that he can come find her later and tell her more about Japan. Yeah, a nun working at a cabaret, just roll with it for now. Having spent a good chunk of time at the expo, Ogami returns to the embassy to meet up with Sakomizu, who wants to celebrate the occasion by bringing the lieutenant to one of his favorite local haunts, which just so happens to be Le Chat Noir, just a stone's throw away from his office. Le Chat Noir is a riff on the real historical cabaret club called Le Chat Noir, which you might know better as that thing from the poster you see in every other college dorm room. Sure enough, it's not long before Ogami gets to see Erika again, and... Erika -kun ha! Oh. Ah! 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 After that, Ogami is introduced to the owner, an older woman who goes by the nickname Grand Mère, often seen with her cat Napoleon. With her are her two personal maids, Mel Raison and Si Caprice. Mel is the quiet, introverted one, while Si is the fun-loving extrovert. Despite their opposite personalities, they get along with each other quite well. Very, very well, in fact. They seem to be very good friends. The introductions are soon interrupted by Erica hyping up the crowd from up on stage, which serves as our introduction to one of this game's new gameplay features. All of the lip system additions from Sakura Wars 2 carry over in this installment. Timing lips, click lips, the gang's all here. The lips cursor icons have gotten a slight makeover, now having a charming cat motif, but otherwise, the actions available to you are the same as before. All of them. What's actually new this time around, though, is analog lips. In analog lips prompts, you are offered only a single choice of what to do or say. However, the intensity of this given phrase or action is all up to you. How hard do you shake someone's hand? How loudly do you call out to someone? Etc. To pull the curtain back a bit, there are only a fixed number of potential outcomes to your input, but nevertheless, it's dynamic and variable in a way the other lips just aren't, adding new dimensions to character interactions. Analog glyphs would go on to be a defining feature of the series, to the point where, when Sega nixed most of the lips variants in Sakura Wars on PS4 in an attempt to streamline things, Analog Glyphs still made the cut, and has since appeared in other Sega games as well. After we've been given our first taste of Analog Glyphs, we're allowed to roam freely throughout the establishment in a full 3D map, where we eventually run into Erika once more. They spend some time getting to know each other a little better, and Ogami teaches her more about Japan, but soon enough, it's time for everyone to go home. Mel and C give Ogami a little souvenir, then Sakumizu shows him to his new apartment, where he'll be living for the rest of the game. Once inside, Ogami winds up his new music box and reminisces on his time with the Imperial Combat Review back in Tokyo, before eventually turning in for the night. Morning comes and Ogami wakes up hungry, prompting him to hit up the local cafe for breakfast. He just so happens to run into Erika again, and the two decide to eat together. By now you surely noticed Erika's just a tad bit clumsy. Like, the first game tried to depict Sakura as a little clumsy, and sure, she had her moments, but Erika's on a whole other level. She is apocalyptically clumsy. The Omega Klutz. Once the dust has settled and Ogami checks to see if Erika's still alive, they are approached by a very fancy looking lady. Erika. This is Glycine Blumer. Normandy no 
Now, you might think that after Sumire and Orihime, they'd run out of ways to characterize the aristocratic girls in the series. Whereas Sumire is conceited and Orihime is bratty, Grisin is proud to a fault, taking her position of nobility and the responsibilities it comes with very seriously. If you find that confusing at all, don't worry, I made you this handy chart. However, she takes these responsibilities so seriously, it makes her extremely suspicious of Ogami early on. It also doesn't help that she might be more similar to Orihime than I first let on, as she's got some capital O opinions about Japanese people. Or at least, that's how she presents herself. You'll find out what I mean later. After a couple of snide remarks at Ogami's expense, she leaves him alone with Erika, who then decides to give him a grand tour of Montmartre, the game's central hub. It's here that we see one of the most deceptively fundamental changes this game has to offer. Whereas in the first two games, you only ever explored the theater and one or two other bespoke areas, the game world in 3 is far more expansive. Not only does Les Chat Noir get its own map, but so does the rest of Montmartre, as well as multiple other unique areas later in the game. You get to visit numerous distinct locations, from a bustling market, to a fancy restaurant, to a seedy bar, to a lively circus, and more. You can meet your friends walking around, living their lives beyond the confines of the theater walls. What's more, you get to meet plenty of recurring named characters who don't have any direct affiliation with the cabaret at all, such as the hapless police inspector Jim Evian, or the perpetually weary abbot of Erika's monastery, Father René Renault. On top of that, these side characters also have trust levels with Ogami, not just the main cast like with the other games. And yes, they are very much worth developing, as you'll see in a bit. Plus, not only do the main cast get chain events like in Sakura Wars 2, but so do some of these side characters. As a result, the world has a much greater scope than in prior games. It feels more tangible, expansive, and lived in, and your actions within it feel more impactful. The vibe is immaculate too, thanks in part to the music. The whole soundtrack is phenomenal, as expected of Kohei Tanaka, but I particularly like the chill atmosphere the overworld music brings. Sure, accordion music is pretty on the nose as background music for Paris, but it's nonetheless calm, peaceful, and whimsical. It perfectly captures the mood of strolling through the cobblestone streets on a breezy morning. Of course, all this would mean nothing if the design of said game world wasn't compelling to begin with. Okay, before we continue, I have something I've been wanting to get off my chest for a while now. I am French. Half French, that is. I know, I know. It's a sin for which I'm still trying to atone to this very day. I mention this because during my time playing Sakura Wars 3, I felt a faint nostalgia as I spent my time going through its fictionalized version of Paris. It's a completely different time period for which I have no frame of reference, and yet it still feels cozy and familiar. God knows it's not a perfect representation, as I'll get to in a bit, and it's definitely a romanticized, idealized depiction, but it nevertheless rings true in a weird way. Part of the reason why is because the game is surprisingly well researched. You see, during the game's development, the staff visited Paris as they planned the game out, detailing their trip in a travelogue that's still up on the official Sakura Wars website, complete with photos, staff comments, and anecdotes. And I'm pleased to say, their work paid off. At least in my opinion. For one thing, they absolutely nailed the casual racism. But seriously, of particular note is how the neighborhood of Montmartre is recreated. The main venue of this game is Les Chat Noir, which a flyer on the main menu screen tells us is located at Place Blanche in Montmartre. The real Le Chat Noir moved between many locations during its operating history, with the final location being roughly a block down the street from Place Blanche. Amusingly enough though, judging by the travelogue, the developers weren't even aware of this, as they had instead gone to its second location at 12 Rue Victor Massé, roughly half a kilometer away from its final location, only to be greeted with nothing but a plaque. Their decision to place the fictional club in Place Blanche was instead inspired by another cabaret club you might know a little better, 
an establishment by the name of Moulin Rouge. Judging by the in-game map, Le Chat Noir is located on the northernmost corner of Place Blanche, which would be right next door to Moulin Rouge. Furthermore, based on this location, the other Montmartre landmarks represented in the game, such as the local cemetery and the famous Place du Tertre, are all accurately located in relation to it, albeit shrunk down for size. Some of the locations are fudged a bit, like the river and attached park shown in the southeast corner of the map, which is likely supposed to be the Canal Saint-Martin, which in actuality is a lot farther away than this map would suggest. Really, the only thing that smacks me as overtly inaccurate is the lack of sex boutiques all over the place. As we walk around with Erica, we're introduced to yet another new gameplay feature, the Event Catch. Just like in the first two games, you'll occasionally run into automatic events when traversing certain areas of the map. But this time, the game also introduces overworld events that, when triggered, will slow down time and start a countdown, letting you decide whether or not you want to engage with this event. Engaging with it will cost you the usual five minutes on the clock, and there are some instances where it's better to just ignore the event altogether. Just keep moving, don't make eye contact. However, the event will usually stay active on the map for a little while longer, so you can change your mind and circle back around to it if you so choose. Anyhow, it's eventually time for Ogami's first day of work at the Embassy, so Erika escorts him all the way to Place du Tertre before it starts to rain. The rain brings back unpleasant memories for Erika. Ever since she was little, she was able to perform her so-called miracles, which at first delighted the people around her. But over time, they grew to fear her, and so she eventually left to serve at the monastery on a rainy day much like this. Ogami reassures her that her powers are a gift from God, which successfully cheers her up and gives her the confidence she needs to fight. Before Ogami can press her on that specific phrasing, they're interrupted by lightning, and soon enough, the rain clears and they part. Ogami checks in with Sakomizu, who gives him his first assignment, to attend a ball in his stead. A ball held by one Countess Isabel Lilac. Not even five seconds upon arriving, Ogami gets accosted by Inspector Aquafina, but soon gets saved by a familiar face. It turns out that Countess Lilac is none other than Grand Mère, the proprietor of Les Chat Noirs. She leaves Ogami to mingle with the guests and starts talking to Glycine, who Ogami can't help but notice is glaring in his direction. We don't want to cause a scene, so we just put up with this dude's crap. Until eventually, Glycine makes her way over and ejects him from the premises. She then admonishes Ogami for not standing up for himself. And before he can get a word in edgewise, the party gets crashed by a swarm of rabbits, led by a giant bunny in a top hat. No, I'm not kidding. This is Cecil, and he's no ordinary rabbit. <laughs> he's the first of several humanoid animal creatures we'll be facing in this game, referred to as the Phantoms. Cizo's stated motive for wreaking havoc is that he can't stand the sound of other people enjoying themselves. Basically, he's a hater. Glycine wastes no time challenging the homicidal rabbity thing to a duel, and he obliges. Almost as soon as it's begun, the duel comes to an end as Erika busts in, crucifix gun blazing, telling Ogami they need to evacuate the guests. Ogami wishes to himself that he had the Kobu on hand to deal with this situation, and... Try to contain your shock, because as it turns out, Le Chat Noir was actually a front for yet another combat review. The Paris Combat Review. That's right, Ogami fell for the same trick... again. What's with you, man? Come on! Alas, this review has only just recently been established. So at the moment, this flower division consists merely of Erika, Glycine, and now Ogami himself as their captain. Grandmère acts as their commander, and where Yonetto was serious but still easygoing, Grandmère has a more no-nonsense attitude and a much drier sense of humor. As you'll see as we progress, though, that's not all that sets them apart. 
Mel and C, meanwhile, act as intelligence and transport. Basically the French version of the Wind Division. While the Paris Combat Review may still be lacking in combatants, they've made up for it in maintenance staff, led by Chief Mechanic jean Il. He's a friendly guy, but he's very serious about his work, constantly working his crew to the bone. Jean soon introduces Ogami to his new ride, the Kobu F, the brainchild of both Le Chat Noir's engineers and Kanzaki Heavy Industries back in Japan. It's pretty much the Kobu you already know and love, but French. With more European-inspired design choices compared to the original Kobu's slightly more Japanese aesthetics. Now that Ogami's finally been filled in on his real job, it's time to head down to our first battlefield. And much like the Imperial Combat Review, the Paris Combat Review has its own train to get us there. The Bullet Train Eclair. It's not called a bullet train for nothing either. Battlefield for our first mission is the famous Avenue des Champs Élysées, where Inspector Dasani and his officers are currently losing their own fight against Cizou and his army of mechanized drones. These aren't quite the Maso Kihei from prior installments, but rather new grunts known as Steam Beasts. Or, alternatively, as they're called in the brief glimpses of French text in the opening, Vapo Monstre, which cracks me up so bad I'm almost tempted to call them that throughout the rest of this video, but I'll refrain. All right, that's enough preamble, let's get to the fighting. Which, more than anything else, is the most radically overhauled aspect of this game, taking full advantage of the 3D space and offering some very smart changes to the existing formula. They call it the arms system. For starters, there's no grid. You are free to walk wherever you please, so long as you have the meter for it. All actions in the game are dictated by this gauge at the bottom of the screen, movement included. Moving more than a set distance will deplete the gauge by one pip at a time, though walking back will replenish that pip. The pips are in a red pending state until you choose to perform any other action, such as attacking. Ogami, as always, uses his trusty twin katanas. Dual wield! Erika uses a machine gun that can hit multiple enemies at once from a distance, but as a trade-off, her bullets don't do all that much damage. Grisin, on the other hand, wields a huge axe and hits enemies at medium range with tremendous force. Normal attacks take one pip of meter, but by holding down or mashing the A button, you can chain attacks together so long as you've got the pips for it. Chaining attacks together makes the damage of each attack in said chain gradually stronger, with more elaborate animations to match. Once you reach five attacks, the chain will end in a flashy final blow. If you're near an ally unit, the chain might instead end with a combo attack for slightly more damage, much like the combos in Sakura Wars 2. Incidentally, these ally proximity triggers are not just offensive anymore, but defensive as well. If you're targeted by an enemy, a nearby ally has a chance to interrupt them and save you. So, how do you know how many attacks you'll need to finish an enemy off anyway? By looking down at your controller where the Dreamcast's VMU will give you an approximation of how many attacks you'll need to finish a foe off. When you're not attacking, the VMU will instead show you a mini-map of the area around you, though, personally, I keep forgetting to use this feature at all. Completing a full combo doesn't necessarily mean you're done. If you have any leftover pips, you're free to spend that on more attacks. However, that leftover meter might actually be better spent on some other actions available to you. Those actions being Defend, Heal, and, when applicable, Charge your Super Meter. Some of the more observant among you may have realized this means you can theoretically charge, heal, and defend all in the same turn, but whether or not that's possible all depends on your choice of Captain Command. Yes, the Captain Command system is back, but this time around it has zero bearing on the stats of your units, instead affecting the cost of your non-attack options. Yes, I am aware that, given these conditions, you can't actually heal, defend, and charge in a single turn with the action costs as they are. 
but you're forgetting a crucial factor here. Ogami is a Thundercock Super Chad who doesn't abide by the laws of man, and can swap between each command as many times as he wants, so long as his turn is still active. That means he can charge in fire mode, and both defend and heal in mountain mode, with enough gauge left over to move or land a few attacks, including a super attack. Once the super gauge is full, you can hit the B button to switch over from normal attacks to super attacks, then spend just one pip for big damage. In this game, each character's super move has a unique area of effect pattern. Grisin has an offensive super with a thick wavy line AoE, damaging everything in its path, and Erika has a healing super with an overtly cross-shaped AoE, meaning that, though it is massive, positioning yourself is key. Also, just like before, you have the option for a team attack with each character during their dedicated chapter, so long as both units have full meter and are in close proximity to one another. <laughs> you might have noticed I skipped over Ogami, but that's because he's a bit of an odd duck this time around, as he now also benefits from trust levels, albeit in a different way. Whereas the girls get big buffs that only last one chapter and have to be built back up during the next, Ogami gets permanent buffs that start small but gradually increase over time, dictated by not only his trust with the main team, but his trust with the various other characters I mentioned before. His choices also affect what type of super he gets access to, which have varying effects and ranges. I friggin' adore the arm system. It feels like the next logical step from the combat featured in Sakura Wars 1 and 2. It's way more open-ended and free thanks to the variety of actions you can do per turn, and the full range and granularity of character movement. It just feels good to control. Few things are as satisfying as finding the exact right spot to close the distance between you and an enemy while spending the least amount of meter on movement, then unleashing a full flurry of combos and knocking out an enemy grunt, while still having pips to spare afterward. Of course, this isn't to say the arm system is totally flawless either. There are a few minor shortcomings. For starters, it is very easy to block your allies off in tight spaces. You might think you've left enough space for a teammate to squeeze through, but nope. Your huge metal ass has taken up too much room, and now said teammate has to waste their turn twiddling their thumbs. You can cheese the hitboxes and wiggle your way through sometimes, but generally, don't count on it. However, the biggest problem with the arms system is, it's too good. The combat is super easy thanks to the plethora of combat options available. Sure, the first two games weren't all that hard to begin with, Sakura Wars 2 only made me sweat with a few of the later combat encounters, but I rarely ever felt like I was in any actual danger here. Granted, it's only easy if you're actually using your brain and taking advantage of all the tools at your disposal, but still, the AI could stand to punish you a bit more for your obvious mistakes. Since you can see their action gauges too, you can really tell when they're pulling their punches. Also, since the captain commands no longer affect the actual stats of your units, there's little downside to just parking everyone that isn't Ogami in mountain mode all the time so you can take advantage of the cheap defending and healing. Hell, I didn't even mention how the shield mechanics back in this game, so you can still protect yourself and one other team member from receiving any damage whatsoever up to three times per battle. Of course, just because a game is easy, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. And so it goes with Sakura Wars 3. The freedom and feel of the combat make up for the lack of difficulty. In the end, it's just plain fun. Once we've mopped up Sizo's grunts, all that's left is the big bun himself. However, before Ogami and the others can spring into action, who else should show up but the CEO of racism himself? Here to talk shit and, inevitably, get hit. Well, if Ogami didn't listen to his conscience and shield the prick from Sizo's attacks, that is. The guy's about as grateful as you'd expect, leading Glycine to question Ogami why his pride would even allow him to defend someone who's done nothing but disrespect him. His response, that his desire to protect the people of the city is unconditional, impresses the two girls. And so the first boss fight begins. Sizo's Steam Beast comes equipped with unique leg parts that let it bounce around the map at will. You can target these individually, and breaking just one of them will keep Sizo grounded for good, letting you boop him on the snoot uninterrupted, and he's down in no time. 
Now that the threat's been taken care of, Ogami teaches the two the flower division tradition of the victory pose, and... Oh god, the French girls think I'm cringe. What, no, no, come on, don't look at me like that. No, come on. With peace restored to Paris, the gang celebrate by watching fireworks. And all's well that ends well, as we head straight into chapter two. Now that Ogami's true purpose in Paris has been made clear, Grandmère assigns him with his new cover job, along with his new uniform. Which is actually his old uniform, because our boy's back to being an usher, as well as a general purpose errand boy. It's not all bad news, though, because Ogami gets another gift. A VMU, I mean, a portable kinematron. A pocket-sized version of the real thing that's only able to receive text messages and unable to send anything at all. Basically, a steam-powered pager. You kids know what a pager is, right? Oh man. Anyway, whenever you get a message on the portable kinematron, you actually have to look down at the VMU in your Dreamcast controller to read the message as it's scrolling by. With the meeting over and done with, everyone's dismissed so they can get Le Chat Noir ready for opening. Remember, since this is a cabaret club, they have to operate every single night. You get to experience Le Chat Noir before opening, during operation, and after closing, with each time period having its own distinct vibe. During the daytime, the club's closed, but once night falls, Le Chat Noir is open for business and bustling with life, letting you catch a glimpse of the performances, buy bromides, and shoot the shit with whoever might be in attendance. Once the evening's show is over and the guests have gone home, the lights go out and you're on your own. On paper, all this might not sound like much, but in practice, it goes a long way to making the game's world feel even more alive. Once Ogami gets changed into his new old threads, Mel and C give him a few tutorials and a tour of the facilities, after which they give him his first assignment as errand boy, picking up veggies at the local street market. There he finds Erica, who's looking for a flower vase, and just as the two of them are about to enjoy a little shopping together, a horse drawing a nearby carriage cuts loose and goes on a rampage. Ogami tries to stop it with very limited success, when suddenly... <laughs> This is Kukriko, a young Vietnamese girl who works at the circus in town as a magician. Cheese it! What the? Cheese it! Fuck! As you just saw, she's also a capable acrobat, great with animals, and generally just kind of adorable. Kukriko offers to help Erica look for a vase, and Ogami in turn offers to repay her kindness, a decision he probably immediately regrets. What all these food scraps are for isn't immediately clear, but just as they're done picking up the last of it, a kindly old man approaches Kokriko, seemingly familiar with her. This is Laurence Roland, a jeweler who dotes after Kokriko as though she were his own daughter. She enjoys his company, mentioning offhand that she wishes more adults were like him, before she and Ogami leave to bring the food scraps to her quote-unquote friends. They arrive at Kukriko's Circus of Employment, Cirque de... <sighs> okay, time for a quick little rant. The quality of the French in this game is... mixed. Like, weirdly so. During the intro, the French text laid over the footage is actually fairly accurate, for the most part, if a little stilted at times. However, in the game itself, it's a total crapshoot. Like, in this instance, the circus is called Cirque de Europe, when the grammatically correct name would be Cirque d'Europe. However, the name the characters call it in Japanese is Cirque de Euro, which is even worse! Another prominent example is right on the file select screen, where you're hit with a double whammy of fil list and non fil. And that's not even the worst of it! For a game as relatively well researched as this was, the linguistic shortcomings are legitimately baffling. Like, come on, there's a French language supervisor right there in the credits! <sighs> anyway, 
The food scraps, as it turns out, were for the circus animals all along. The two start by feeding a recently injured tiger, but no sooner had they started, they're interrupted by the circus's cartoonishly evil ringleader, named Dunicour. He immediately gets on Coquelicot's case for getting food for the animals instead of practicing her routine, threatening to cut their meals in half, before he straight up starts kicking the poor tiger. I mean, for fuck's sake, not even Satan acted this evil right off the bat. After he's left, Kukriko explains to Ogami that she puts up with Dunikuo's crap because, well, this is all she's got. The circus keeps her fed and gives her a roof over her head. She tells Ogami that she's happy with the way things are, fooling literally nobody, before she runs off to get ready for the night's show. Almost immediately after she's left, though, a loud commotion is heard from the main tent, where all the animals have started to go wild. And even with all her skills, not even Kokriko can calm down an entire circus. Thankfully, the day is saved by someone who actually can. Her name is Carcella, and she can seemingly talk to animals, which immediately earns her the admiration of Kokriko. Dunikul's a big fan too, for far less noble reasons, and he hires her right on the spot. Later that evening, Erika, upon hearing that Kokriko works at the circus, suggests stopping by to see her perform, but the others look like they'll need a little convincing. It's then that we get this one last new gameplay type, the so-called dining mode, where you talk with various characters all at once as you share a meal or drink. You have a limited number of turns, as indicated by this clock, to talk to everyone in whatever order and reach the desired outcome, in this case, convincing them all to come to the circus. This is probably my least favorite gameplay addition in Sakura Wars 3. It's just kind of meandering and pointless. I get the idea behind it. It's meant to simulate a dynamic conversation with multiple participants, but in practice, you're basically spinning your wheels as you fumble your way through the correct sequence of conversations until the game decides you're done. These conversations would ultimately be better served with regular lips prompts. Ogami finally manages to convince Glycine to come along, but Mel, on the other hand, has a prior engagement and thus can't come along, and C doesn't want to go without her because they're such good friends. Later that night, we see Carcella again, only not really. As it turns out, she's secretly another one of the Phantoms of Paris, a snake lady whose real name is Piton, and there's nothing Piton loves more than devouring gemstones. I don't think that's a thing snakes actually do, but hey, I'm no biologist. The next day, Ogami, Erika, and Glycine head over to the circus, and when Kukriko asks for the help of an audience member, Erika very enthusiastically volunteers herself. Once the show's over, Ogami and the girls are about to head over to the Chat Noir to open up for the evening, before Erika suggests saying goodbye to Kukriko before they leave. It's then that they stumble upon Kukriko and Carcella sharing a tender moment, as Kukriko asks if she can call her Mama. Personally, when I see Piton, I can't say Mommy is the first thing that comes to mind, but hell, I know some people out there want to fuck the snakes from XCOM, so what do I know? Sometime thereafter, we find Dunicour admiring the jewel in his hat, which, in light of what we know about his new employee, is the single biggest death flag the game could possibly raise. And sure enough, Rip Bozo. Back at Les Chat Noirs, as Glycine makes her stage debut under the alias Blue Eye, Monsieur Roland, who just so happens to be in attendance that evening, discusses his newest acquisition with Grand-Mère, a giant ruby known as the Red Maiden's Tear, which he plans to put on exhibit at the Place de la Concorde. With impeccable timing, 
Inspector Volvic busts through the front door in a huff to warn Grandmer about a recent string of jewelry thefts, who then asks Ogami in turn to patrol the neighborhood. After meandering around a bit, he arrives just in time to catch Piton in the act, and after Erica comes in with the assist, they give chase as the Phantom tries to escape. Piton runs all the way back to the circus and changes back to her human form, but all for naught as Ogami and Erica catch up to her, at which point she just says, to hell with it, and goes beast mode. Kukriko runs out at just the right time for Piton to take a hostage. Kukriko, heartbroken at being betrayed by her newfound mother figure, starts to smile. だから。笑うんだ。悲しい時ほど笑うんだ。辛い時ほど笑うんだよ。in a blast of light, she sends Piton packing, but passes out in the process. After bringing her to Le Chat Noir, Ogami surmises the trauma awakened the latent spirit power within her, and Grandmère, practically licking her lips at the opportunity to recruit a child soldier, wastes no time suggesting Kokriko become a part of the review. It's decided that Kokriko herself will have the final say in the matter, and everyone but Ogami leaves as he decides to keep watch over her. Soon thereafter, she reveals she was awake the whole time and heard the whole conversation. He comforts her by saying he'll still be there for her even if she doesn't join, and that she doesn't have to smile if she doesn't want to. Early the next morning, the alarm blares out, and we find out steam beasts have suddenly appeared in Place de la Concorde, where the jewel exhibit is currently underway. Piton is after the Red Maiden's tear in particular, wanting to devour it despite how comically massive it is, but Laurence isn't having any of it. Coquelicot immediately recognizes Monsieur Roland on the monitor, giving her the last push she needed to join the fight. Just like in Sakura Wars 2, we're given two options for how to tackle this mission. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather break stuff right now. The battle takes place in Place de la Concorde, which basically looks nothing like this in real life, like not even at the time. Rather than being a large open plaza, this map's a tightly packed cluster of shops. The one accurate part is the Luxor obelisk in the middle, which, yeah, if you didn't know, there's an Egyptian obelisk smack dab in the middle of Paris that's actually real. This fight marks Kukiko's combat debut. She attacks in a circular AoE all around her, similar to Iris in the old games. Though she's not a particularly heavy hitter, she still deals decent damage and is particularly useful for taking out clusters of enemies. Her super, meanwhile, has a far more limited range, just whatever can fit in this little cat-shaped field. Kukiko is also the only unit with unique traversal mechanics. Whereas the other units can only jump as far up as small ledges, Kukriko can, quite literally, leap tall buildings in a single bound. Don't get too used to it though, the applications outside of this mission are depressingly limited. Nonetheless, these robotic acrobatics will be key for this mission, as there are sharpshooters placed on the roofs all over this map, and climbing the rooftops can let you quickly bypass these barrel barricades. Once you take out all the cannons, Kukriko checks in on Laurence, who's unaware that it's her in the big tin can. He points out that his giant ruby, the Red Maiden's Tear, is still up on the obelisk, just in time for a giant metal snake to pop up and snatch it. Piton has the gem in her grasp, but before she gets the chance to eat it, abracadabra, her ass gets punked. Kukiko managed to steal the real one back, earning the admiration of the crowd and the unbridled ire of Piton as we head into this chapter's boss fight. The ground in this battle is dotted with mechanical snakes burrowed underground. Walking over where they're burrowing will trigger a beeping noise, and if you stop on top of them, they'll attack. 
Getting attacked by these snakes, or getting hit with Beton Super, will inflict a poison status, which you can clear up by healing. The snakes will move to a different location every turn, so you have to keep moving as you wail on her mech until she eventually goes down. The day is saved, and Coquelicot formally joins Les Chat Noir as a headlining act with her magic routine, while still performing at the circus in the meantime, and probably violating a few child labor laws in the process. Chapter 3 Ogami makes the realization that his team is critically lacking in teamwork, and eventually comes up with the idea of a game day, as a team building exercise. He gets them all together to play a variety of traditional Japanese games, such as Hanetsuki, which could basically be described as Japanese badminton, only with the added bonus of scribbling on the opponent's face with ink whenever they drop the shuttlecock. This also serves as an excellent segue to talk about minigames, which this time around are an eye-popping 3D. This is more than just a mere presentation gimmick, as this enables a wider variety of minigames than before. For instance, the Hanetsuki minigame has you lobbing shots back and forth between you and Kokiko, who will eventually try curve shots to trick you with the perspective and screw up your volleys. While we're on this tangent, where Sakura Wars 1 had Koi Koi and 2 had President, 3 has both Blackjack and Poker. There's a few bonus minigames as well, but I'll discuss those later. Anyhow, Glisin gets fed up with these games, and because she's still giving Orihime a run for her money, deems them inferior to more sophisticated, intelligent Western games. They suck. You guys need to get with the times. When Ogami calls her out for being prejudiced, she snaps back by challenging him to a duel. If Ogami wins, Gisin has to fall in line. If he loses, he will be forced to become her servant. Ogami accepts, and Gisin brings the group to her mansion, where they'll be holding the duel atop the mast of a sunken galleon in her backyard. What, you mean you don't have one? As Ogami and Glycine duke it out, Glycine loses her footing. But no matter if you choose to press the advantage or not, Glycine still beats Ogami's ass, making him the newest maid in the Bleu Mer Estate's employ. He reports to the head maid, Madame Tadevu. <laughs> Glycine soon drops by to inform them there are two other maids joining the ranks today. They happen to be none other than Erika and Kukiku, who have decided to help ease his newfound burden. Or at least, that's the intention. Eventually, after performing enough tasks around the mansion, it's time for Ogami's break. He wanders out to the yard, where he finds Glycine mulling over a chess game. It's her family's own super-special, ultra-strategic variant of the game, which happens to remind Ogami of Shogi, which he decides to teach Glycine using the chessboard at hand. Shogi is a Japanese board game that's roughly equivalent to chess, with many of its pieces sharing the same movement patterns as those in chess. The main difference in Shogi is you're able to use any opponent pieces you capture as your own. Glycine gets absorbed in it, and thus Ogami proves to her that Japanese games can, in fact, be intellectually stimulating after all leaving her feeling just a tad bit sheepish. The next day, a mysterious visitor shows up at the Bleu Mer Estate, an eye-patched man by the name of Count Rich. Erika and Kukliku, curious about the guest, spy on him, and soon enough, Erika pulls an Erika and gets them all caught. Kukliku apologizes, and the Count immediately shows his true colors as he attempts to physically discipline her though Ogami intervenes. Delivu quickly de-escalates the situation by sending Ogami to call for Glycine. Along the way, he notices the Count hunting pigeons in the garden with his bare hands, which, to be honest, doesn't even top the list of weird shit rich people like to do. Upon being called for, Glycine reveals to Ogami that she might very well get married to this creep. She explains it's her duty to keep the Blumer legacy going, though it's obvious she's not terribly enthused about the prospect especially since she actually saw what he tried to pull with Kukiko earlier. Later, when cleaning up the dining room, Erika stumbles upon one of Glycine's earrings lying on the ground, and Ogami goes to return it to her. Glycine's taking a shower, so Ogami decides to try again later, walking out the door only to get smacked in the face by another and fall unconscious.
一体俺は一体大丈夫ですかあえ大丈夫です無理をしてはいけませんよ This lady's name is Hanabi Kitaoji A very quiet and timid girl who always dresses in black like she's going to a funeral She's a friend of Glissine's and lives in the Bleu Mer mansion with her Just goes to show that the I have a Japanese friend excuse only goes so far Well, I joke, but Hanabi lets slip that Glissine has actually been rather positive about Ogami in private She also admits that Glissine seems uneasy about her duty to seek out a flawless groom and that she won't even confide in Hanabi her true feelings. Ogami sets out once more to both hear the truth straight from Glissine and to return her earring. Once he gives it back to her, she spills her guts. She feels defined by her status, that she has no choice but to protect the Blumer name, that such is her lot in life. Ogami tries to comfort her, but she snaps back, claiming that he wouldn't understand. He replies that he understands all too well, that he has something to protect as well. Glissine appreciates the gesture, but ultimately comes to the conclusion that her fate is bound to her family name. Later that night, back at Echette Noir, Kukiko puts on her debut performance while Inspector Arrowhead informs Ogami of a recent spate of disappearances, with all the missing persons being high-profile aristocrats. We quickly find out what happened to these folks, as we're soon thereafter introduced to our next phantom, Leon. A lion man who prides himself on being the only living being fit to be called a nobleman. And wouldn't you know it, he's been masquerading as Count Riche, intending to make Glissine his next kidnapping victim. The next morning, Grandmère fills everyone in on the missing persons, with one of them being none other than the real Count Riche, immediately sounding off alarm bells on Ogami's brain. Grandmère, wanting to confirm this hunch as discreetly as possible, orders him to check it out alone. He rushes over to Glissine's place and challenges the so-called Count to a duel. The two fight in the same configuration that he and Glissine fought in earlier, and now that he has nothing holding him back, Ogami wins without a sweat, soundly defeating the imposter. Leon drops the act, revealing his true identity, and skedaddles off. Before Ogami can pursue, Glissine calls him out for holding back during their own duel, accusing him of sexism. He holds his ground without flinching when she tries to psych him out with her axe. And in doing so, he finally earns her respect. Together, they return to Des Chat Noir to plan their next steps. And, as it turns out, letting Leon get away was the right call, as the crew back at base traced him back to his hideout, the Bastille. Well shit, no wonder nobody thought to look for the missing nobles there. The Bastille doesn't even exist anymore. It was torn down over a hundred years before the events of this game. Hell, even the underground remnants had been dug out to make way for the Paris Metro a few decades before this point in time. <sighs> you know, the fun thing about this series is that whenever you spot discrepancies like that, you can just say, alternate history, and everything's fine. Ah, for glaving out loud. Mel and C inform us that the only way into the Bastille is through the sewers, but there's a huge impenetrable door blocking it off. We can open it by either tracking down two keys or activating its special unlocking mechanism, and we're opting for the latter. The mechanism in question is activated by walking across these glowing magic circles. However, you can only activate them while they're blue. Try that while they're red, and you'll get hurt. What's weird is the magic circles change color in real time, so there's no real danger. Just wait until they've changed from red to blue, then get to stepping. Hell, doing so doesn't even end your turn or deplete your pending movement pips, so you can just stomp on one, then move back to safely replenish your gauge. The bigger challenge is the small walkways, which often have you inadvertently blocking each other's path. Not even Kukiko's jumping powers are a match for Ogami's giant metal dumpy. Once the mechanism's been fully activated, Ogami, Erika, and Kukiko go on ahead to trudge through the sewage, while Glissine stays behind to keep watch. She doesn't have long to wallow in her self-pity before Leon shows up and smacks her across the room. He then attempts to shut the gate to trap the others, which makes Glissine get over her hang-ups and throw herself into the muck to keep the door open. Leon starts wailing on her, but Glissine holds firm, even as her kobu springs a leak and starts filling with raw sewage. <laughs> Kokoro made kegasarenai kagiri. 
貴族の誇りを捨てないあの男も私にそれを教えてくれたの真の貴族たる心というものを As he's about to land the finishing blow, he's knocked back by Ogami's timely interception, while the other two fish Glissi now. And after a quick speech from Ogami, it's boss time. Not much to say about this battle, it's very straightforward. The space is pretty limited, but if you're smart about who Ogami is shielding and placing your units accordingly, you'll be fine. Leon is finally defeated, and Glissi finally lightens up, leading the group in their victory pose. And later joining them in the Japanese games she had previously frowned upon. I really enjoy this chapter. It's a great redemption arc for Glissine. Orihime got a similar character arc where she overcame her biases and prejudices, but Glissine's happens much earlier in the story, which is frankly a relief after having to put up with Orihime's verbal abuse for over half of Sakura Wars 2. Where I find Glissine's arc to be even better, though, is that. She doesn't just learn racism bad, she learns more about herself and her relationship with her social class, about what those responsibilities she holds in such high esteem truly entail. It's a more profound change overall. It doesn't quite make up for some of the out of line shit she said beforehand, no. But she's got way more time to make up for that than Orihime did. After all, we're not even a third of the way through the game yet, as we've only just reached Chapter 4. Grandmère has assembled the Flower Division in the command center to announce the active recruiting of more members. She tosses them a newspaper to get a load of the lead candidate, an infamous criminal known as Lobelia Carlini. <laughs> who's only just recently been arrested and begun her sentence of 1,000 years. Glissine, who was, up to this point, merely opposed to the idea, is now totally outraged. But regardless of whether you side with her or not, Grandmère insists you at least go meet Lobelia in person and makes the necessary arrangements. A few hours later, the group reports to La Santé Prison, which, unlike the Bastille from the last chapter, actually still existed then and still does now. In real life, La Santé has a reputation for housing notorious criminals, and Lobelia here fits the bill, to the point where the warden refuses to let the team see her. Despite Gomel's arrangements. It takes some cajoling, but eventually, Ogami persuades the warden to let them see her in her special cell at the bottom of a custom built stone pit. This is Lobelia. <laughs> Despite the aggressive how do you do, Erica, ever the Good Samaritan, goes over to heal her injuries, unfastening her straight jacket and shit. We've got a hostage situation on our hands now, and the warden rushes in, bewildered that things have gotten this badly almost immediately. That's our Erica! However, Erica still has an ace up her sleeve. We choose to trust her, and she enacts her cunning plan to. just be herself. This plan works flawlessly, as Lobelia is left dumbfounded by every single thing coming out of Erica's mouth. This gives Glissine and Kukliko enough time to fasten up her straight jacket once again, successfully defusing the situation. As the others leave, Erica sticks around to heal Lobelia for real, this time without setting her loose. During which, Ogami notices a fleeting moment of vulnerability in Lobelia. Maybe she's not as bad as she seems after all. Grandmère surprises the group at the prison, and after Ogami tells her his opinion on the matter, she suggests he stay the night to keep an eye on our criminal candidate. Even with Lobelia under Ogami's watchful gaze, though, the streets of Paris are not safe, as we are introduced to our next phantom. Nadel, the Scorpion Woman. Allegedly. Like, she's got that tattoo, and the nails are vaguely claw like. 
And I guess the back of her dress kind of looks like a scorpion's claws too. Oh, like, let's be real. They just wanted to be horny with this one. The animal motif had to take a backseat. Her shtick is defacing priceless works of art while claiming she's improving them. But honestly, she needs to step up her game. I've seen better. The next morning, the gang reconvene and meet in the warden's office, where the warden informs Ogami of the various crimes Lobelia has committed, including the assault of one Lord Raymond, during which she was finally arrested. However, Glycine reveals that, according to her own research, Raymond was involved with some shady characters himself. Maybe Lobelia's not so bad, like she's a Robin Hood type or something. However, immediately thereafter, the prison alarm goes off. Lobelia has just attempted a jailbreak. The use of deadly force has been authorized, so it's now a race between Ogami and the cops for who can find her first. The gang split up, with each of them trying to get information from the other prisoners in their own unique way, before Ogami gets a message on his kinematron saying a time bomb has been discovered in one of the cells. The girls leave it to Ogami to defuse the bomb. The bomb is safely defused, but no sooner is the problem solved than another arises, as Ogami receives a distress call from the warden's office. He arrives just in time to apprehend an escapee trying to take advantage of the chaos and from him he learns that Lobelia's actually been lurking in her cell this whole time. Ogami heads down there, and sure enough, there she is, unwilling to cooperate, but here comes Gromel to help butter her up. She offers Lobelia freedom for as long as she's in the review's employ, and Ogami sweetens the pot by offering to lower her 1,000 year sentence for her service. Smash cut to Lobelia's debut performance at Les Chat Noirs, adopting the alias Saphir. Inspector Propel, who just so happens to be in attendance that evening, is thoroughly fooled by this ploy and is heinously down bad for her. He puts his dick away long enough to inform Ogami of the recent spate of fine art slashings, and Kalmer assembles the team after hours to assess the situation. During the strategy meeting, a fight breaks out between Lobelia and Glycine, forcing Kalmer to reveal her contingency plan to keep Lobelia in line, a signed execution warrant. All Grandmère needs to do is say the word and Lobelia's toast. With this ground rule established, Lobelia becomes more cooperative and deduces that the next target is the famous Louvre Art Museum, while Glycine instead reasons that the next likely target would be the less heavily guarded Musée de l'Orangerie nearby. After some noodling around in a dining mode segment, despite there being no meal this time, Ogami makes his choice and we're gonna check the Louvre for our recon mission. This is, indeed, the correct choice, as roughly an hour after keeping watch, completely inconspicuously, a puff of pink smoke knocks all the museum guards out, and Nadel makes her entrance. The team attempt to nab her, but she makes her getaway after surrounding them with a shitload of scorpions. Oh hey, they actually utilized the animal motif, good job. Lobelia is the only one not trapped, and gives chase to the phantom. Ogami breaks free from the trap and goes to provide backup, only to find the two having a very pleasant conversation, plotting to attack the museum together. Lobelia says she'll ultimately go with whoever makes her the better offer. Nadelle offers her half of Paris, while Ogami offers her fucking nothing, and instead threatens to cut her down on the spot, pulling a sword from... out of his pants, I guess. Lobelia replies that she was totally kidding, pinky promise, sending Nadelle into a frenzy, who then begins her assault on the museum. The gang heads back to the Chet Noir, where Ogami must decide what takes priority, the protection of the valuable fine art, or getting all the art lining the hallways safely into storage. We're going with the protection of the valuable art, with Mel making arrangements to get the hallway art taken care of. This fight is Lobelia's big debut, and she's a generally balanced unit, being somewhat weaker than Glycine, but also somewhat faster. She moves by sinking into a black void that slides across the ground, but despite appearances, you can't slide under other units like this. It's basically a fancy walking animation, not a unique traversal perk. The battle takes place on a very spacious map, with the end goal of racing to the opposite side to secure this priceless statue before the enemies can destroy it. They tend to give you a bit of a head start, but come turn two, they'll start rushing on over, and once they get near the statue, they'll start tearing into it. The statue has a life bar of its own, so it's not an instant loss condition, but it's not very durable, so you'd better skedaddle over there nonetheless. 
all you need to do is park Ogami next to the statue, and once this turns up, you'll get an analog lips prompt to carry the statue as gently as possible. If you do it just right, the battle ends immediately, regardless of how many enemies are left. However, don't think we've won just yet. Nadal reappears and takes a hostage. One of the most famous paintings in history, the Mo... Selena. I mean, that's what they keep saying. Mozarina. Mozarina. Soda. Mozarina. Anyway, Lobelia decides to cut to the chase and just burns the fucking thing, robbing Nadell of her leverage as the others look on in shock and horror. <laughs> Thus begins the boss battle, which has a few interesting quirks. Nadell has a large cross-shaped AoE to her attacks, letting her hit multiple targets all around her at once. Not only that, but any unit that gets hit specifically by her tail or her super move will short circuit, making them immobile for one turn. Exploit your shield commands and keep the adds at bay, and you should make it through okay. Once Nadel's been defeated, it's time to deal with the consequences of Lobelia burning a priceless work of art to ash. Until Mel chimes in to say that shit's fake, and the real one's safely in storage. Which, of course, Lobelia knew all along. Totally. Either way, all's well that ends well. The next day, Lobelia's nowhere to be seen, and everyone assumes she's ditched them and ran away. However, Ogami soon discovers her in the dressing room, counting her paper, as it turns out that Grandmère is also rewarding her with fat cash bonuses on top of reducing her sentence. It might only be because of this monetary incentive, but all the same, she's here to stay. Lobelia is an utter joy, my favorite from this game right after Erika. She offers such a stark contrast to the rest of the main cast, not just in this game, but compared to the prior entries as well. Your usual Sakura Wars character is all about peace and justice and whatnot, but for Lobelia, it's fucking crime time 24-7. She's so unrepentant and flippant about it too, but believe it or not, she's one of the good guys. Her attitude will often flip your lips habits on their head, as you'll find the choices that often work with other characters simply do not with her. She hates that goody two-shoes crap, but she doesn't mind it when you talk shit right back at her on occasion. She's got layers in ways none of the other characters do, and her presence throughout the game is a ton of fun. Chapter 5 opens with Ogami reviewing some of the potential new recruits for the Flower Division, but none of them are up to snuff in terms of spirit power. Grandmère decides Ogami should get a little more hands-on with his search, and gives him a portable spirit power detector to try to find suitable candidates out in the wild. Oh, and because he's also the errand boy, he's gotta go order some flowers, too. Ogami wanders aimlessly around Montmartre, scanning random women to no avail, no doubt placing him on some kind of list, and eventually makes his way to the florist where he spots Hanabi, the Japanese girl living with Glycine, heading over to the cemetery. He follows her and finds her getting unusually intimate with one of the graves there. The two share a brief chat, and once she's left, Ogami takes a closer look at the tombstone. It belongs to some guy named Philippe, and what's more, the epitaph mentions Hanabi by name. Ogami then spots a photograph of Hanabi and some other guy laying on the ground. Assuming Hanabi dropped it before leaving, he runs after her to give it back to her. He finds her at the bridge overlooking the river, staring down at the water. Ogami noticed she was acting pretty weird earlier, and now comes to fear the worst. He runs up to her to try to prevent her from jumping, but overexerts himself and winds up plunging into the water instead, which prompts an unusually visceral reaction from Hanabi. Hanabi passes out, and Ogami climbs out of the water to wake her up. He gives her the photo back, and she suddenly scurries off. Ogami notes that the spirit power detector's readings are off the charts, but eh, probably water damage. Ogami makes his way back to Le Chat Noir, where he's pulled into yet another dining mode meeting with the squad, where they discuss his troubles with finding a suitable candidate, as well as the strange goings-on with Hanabi earlier that day. Later, Glycine asks Ogami to see her in private so that they can talk more about Hanabi. After a mild misunderstanding, Glycine tells Ogami all about Philippe. Philippe was Hanabi's fiancé. Ever since his passing, Hanabi has worn her mourning clothes every single day, unable to let go. Later that night, in the rafters of an opera house, we meet yet another phantom, clad entirely in black, his face covered with a plague doctor's mask. 
At first glance, this design is cool as hell, but unfortunately, that appeal is dispelled the second he opens his mouth. This is Masque de Corbeau, and he's something of a romantic, longing for a lover whose heart is shrouded in darkness and death. He's finally found his sweetheart in Hanabi, probing her mind and seeing just how deep her trauma with Philippe goes. He falls head over heels for her, and spends the rest of the chapter being an insufferable simp. Seriously, he's like this non-stop during the entire rest of the chapter. Look, I might talk that way to my Kodan body pillow every night, but the difference here is I'm not a villain trying to be taken seriously. The next day, Grand Mère sends Ogami to pick up the flowers he ordered the day before, during which he spots Hanabi once more at the cemetery, where she finally tells him exactly what happened. Almost one year ago, the couple were about to be wet at sea, but the ship they were on began to sink. Hanabi tried to save her fiancé, but ultimately failed. She ends by saying that even now, Philippe is waiting for her at the bottom of the sea, whispering sweet nothings to her. Ogami, realizing this might not be the healthiest way of coping, tries to cheer her up and invites her out to lunch. They have a lovely time eating together, which makes Masque de Corbeau mad as hell. Once the two have left the establishment, Corbeau swoops in as he transforms into the spitting image of Philippe. Hanabi, given her delicate emotional state, is effortlessly fooled by this, and lets herself get literally carried away by Corbeau. Ogami chases the two down to the famous Opéra Garnier, but is unable to get inside due to some kind of barrier. He rushes back to the Chat Noir and assembles the crew to help get Hanabi back. The Flower Division manage to get inside the Opéra Garnier, only to find they're not in an opera house at all, but aboard a cruise ship at sea on a stormy night. Glycine quickly pieces together that this is an illusion meant to evoke the night of Philippe's death. And from that, Ogami infers that if they can reach Hanabi and snap her out of it, the illusion will be dispelled. Just like that night, the ship slowly begins to sink, filling up with water with each passing turn. You'll need to smash all the gates in your way, keep your units out of the drink, and get Ogami over to Hanabi. Once Ogami reaches Hanabi and tries talking to her, Gorbo starts seething once more and tries to knock Ogami off the boat to recreate the tragedy from the year prior. With the Opéra Garnier back to the way it was, the team tells Hanabi to flee, pointing out that there's a nearby dust chute that should get her to safety. Corbeau, outraged at being cock-blocked, boards his Steam Beast, kicking off one of the more involved boss fights in the game. His mech can fly, and thus can't be attacked by melee units until the ranged units clip his wings and bring him crashing back down to Earth. What's more, Corbeau is a speedy little bastard and will nuke your team with a super almost immediately before most of them even have a chance to guard, putting them at a significant health deficit right from the get-go. Once you've whittled his health down to the halfway mark, Corbeau will unleash his illusions once more, only this time, 
every member of the Flower Division is fooled into thinking their allies are now Steam Beasts, and they proceed to beat the hell out of each other. However, just as Gisin and Ogami are about to kill each other, Hanabi returns with a kobu of her very own. Yeah, turns out that Dust Shoot brought her all the way back to the Paris Combat Reviews Command Center, and Gomel wasted no time putting the fresh meat to work. Gobu, overjoyed to see his beloved return, tries once more to fool her into thinking he's Philippe, this time with the aim of making her walk off the balcony and plummet to her death. However, with Ogami and the others being there for her this time, she finally finds the strength she needs to move on. Hanabi actually takes the time to thank Gorbu for letting her see Philippe one last time. And Gorbu, nice guy that he is, handles this rejection by threatening to kill them all. And so, we enter round two of the fight with Hanabi in tow. As evidenced by her stunt with the arrow, she's a long range attacker, boasting the longest range in the game. And though her attacks have a smaller area of effect than Erika's, she does deal slightly more damage. Repeat the same steps as before, shooting Gorbu out of the sky and kicking him repeatedly in the shins until he's finally, finally defeated. Later, Hanabi and Ogami visit Philippe's grave once more so that she can finally get a little bit of closure. She may never fully come to grips with Philippe's absence, but at least now she's found the will to move on and live her life. After one last big cry, Hanabi formally joins the review. With the team fully assembled, it's time to move on to Disc 2. It's a peaceful day in Paris, and as Ogami goes out to lunch with the rest of the Flower Division, he can't help but feel their teamwork is still lacking. Later that night, Grandmère informs them all that they're taking the next two days off, so that Les Chet Noir can undergo renovations. As Ogami leaves, she pulls him aside to suggest that this brief holiday would be the perfect opportunity to abuse his position of power as captain and date one of his subordinates. And, moral vanguards that we are, we agree wholeheartedly. The next morning, Ogami goes to the nearby cafe to grab breakfast, when the silence is shattered by a familiar sound. Huh? Party wa ina! Our boy Kayama's in town on a layover, and he asks Ogami to give him the grand tour of the neighborhood. After seeing the sights and meeting the locals, Kayama bids him adieu, saying that he has matters of his own to attend to. Before he leaves, though, he gives Ogami one of his usual nuggets of advice, saying he needs to get to know his squad better if they're to work together in harmony. Adieu, Ogami. Stay with that, Ogami finally has to make his choice of who to go out on a date with. And surprisingly enough, this is not the decision that locks in your love interest, so feel free to pick whoever. If the person you're looking to get with is a little low on the trust level chain, Now's your chance to make up lost ground. We're gonna go with Erica this time because, again, mad quirky, but the member with the highest trust level that you didn't invite will call you to ask you out as well. If you accept, you'll go halvesies for the day, but if you decline, you get the whole day to your chosen date while suffering a big trust loss with the person who invited you. I'm sorry, Kukriko, but you're like 12 and I desperately need the funny nun. The next day, the date gets off to a great start, as Erika damn near kills Ogami. And together they head to a nearby park, where Erika often plays soccer with the local children. Ogami joins them, and together they have a grand old time. As they take a short break, Erika notices a boy sitting all by himself, presumably too shy to ask to join the others. Erika, revealing she used to be much the same when she was young, goes to ask the boy if he'd like to join them, but the boy leaves. Erica comes to the realization that maybe it's best to let the boy join the kids of his own accord rather than force him, an observation that Ogami takes to heart. Since we opted to ditch Kukiku, Ogami stays to play with the kids some more, 
when suddenly he gets smacked in the head by a flying soccer ball and passes out. While laying on the ground unconscious, he receives a strange vision. ピエロ。he wakes up to find Erica by his side, and before Ogami can even begin to explain what it is he saw, he gets a message on his portable kinematron. The Champs-Élysées is under attack. The monitors in the command center show a scene of devastation, which Clomel points out took place over the span of a mere five minutes. With no time to waste, the team heads out to stop this new threat. The Flower Division arrives at the scene, which is the same map as the first mission, only there's huge holes in the ground and all the buildings are on fire. Before they can even make a move to put out the fire, a giant laser starts yet another blaze before eventually firing upon them. We then get a clear look at their attacker, a new phantom by the name of Galmar. <laughs> To give the team a taste of his power, he does the unthinkable. He brings back all the phantoms we fought up to this point, who are more than happy to become his loyal servants. Now that our villains have finally fully assembled, an uncomfortable truth is laid bare. These guys kinda suck. Seriously, why is it only the dweebs who come back? Unfortunately, the rogues gallery of Sakura Wars 3 is easily its weakest aspect. Well, okay, I actually like Sizu, alright? He's got that cartoon energy to him. Am I a stinker? But all the others are such fucking goobers. Piton's gimmick with the jewels is dumb, Leon's boring, Gorbeau looks awesome but has the least awesome personality, and Nadel's barely even trying to fit the theme here. I'm Idaho! Gatamal really is the cherry on top of this disappointment Sunday, though. The ringleader of this operation is a creepy leather daddy squid. This dude is not allowed within a thousand feet of Inkopolis Square. Look, I appreciate the tokusatsu-like Monster of the Week concept this game has up to this point. It makes for a nice change of pace after the shadowy organizations of the last two games, but when you line them all up like this, I'm sorry, the villains from Sakura Wars 2 in particular clear these clowns. At any rate, we still have an uphill battle on our hands as everyone except the characters you went on a date with rush on ahead and get themselves surrounded. The map has two massive cannons on the opposite end, which together cover the entire field, and these steam beasts are far stronger than the riffraff we fought before. So, yeah, we're in a tight spot. You'll have to make smart use of your super moves to take out as many of the steam beasts as quickly as possible, as only Ogami, Lobelia, and Glycine can put a decent dent in them otherwise. Afterwards, you'll want to make sure you have enough pips left to get in a hole to avoid the lasers, as they take off a fair chunk of health even when you're guarding. It's very easy to get yourself stuck on the surface if you're not careful. Once you've defeated all the steam beasts and destroyed the cannons, it's time to face Galmar. Or it would be if the team didn't immediately fall apart by trying to solve the problem by themselves. The steam beasts surrounding Galmar are even stronger than the ones we just faced. And once Kalmar gets into his own, it's all over. With Ogami's Kobu quite literally disarmed, and the Flower Division surrounded, the Steam Beasts mercilessly descend upon them. Eventually, Kalmar calls them back before they can finish our heroes off. Not out of mercy, but out of boredom. The Flower Division poses no threat to him. Killing them, he explains, is a waste of his time. The Paris Combat Review has lost. Though they ultimately live to fight another day, they've been left in utter shambles. They are in no state to face these overwhelming odds. They are going to need all the help they can get.
only now, one full chapter into Disc 2, do they play the second intro, featuring a new version of the familiar theme from the first two games. It might not be my favorite version of the theme, but it's nonetheless a great take. Though the next episode preview does unfortunately spoil the surprise, I still love this delayed reveal. It's such a good chaser after the dour note Chapter 6 ends on. It's not just the Tokyo crew that get love here either, as we get new footage of the Paris members too, showcasing the presence Ogami has in each of their lives now. It's a perfect pick-me-up of an intro that knows well to not completely overshadow the new with the familiar. With that, we enter Chapter 7, where we find Ogami haunted in his dreams by the same clown-like figure from before. Things aren't much better for him in the waking world either, as he's still in a funk following the Flower Division's crushing defeat. As he looks at a photo of the Imperial Combat Review, the rest of the squad show up and take a gander at it. After Galmel shares some intel on the Tokyo team with the girls, they're interrupted by the sound of shattering glass. Someone has smashed the front window, leaving behind a rose with a note attached to it, reading, A light comes from the east. The cherry blossoms bloom in the city of Paris. Grandmer instructs Ogami to investigate the note and the culprit who smashed the window, and despite finding a handful of salient clues, Sherlock here just can't crack this case. Just then, Mobilia spots the culprit, who's apparently come back to appreciate their handiwork. Ogami gives chase, only to run into Erika, who was just on her way to the World Flower Expo taking place nearby. Ogami realizes this is likely what the note was referring to, and decides to tag along. The two arrive at the giant cherry tree, and as Ogami takes time to admire it, <laughs> Ogami is finally reunited with not just Sakura, but Sumire and Iris as well. Okay, but where's Koran though? No, seriously, you don't understand. It's been like five months. I need to see Koran right now. Alas, it's just these three, at least for now. But all the same, it's great to see them again. Erika, in particular, is quite happy to finally get to meet her seniors, and suggests they hold a welcoming party for them back at Les Chatenois. Things get off to a good start, but not even five minutes pass before Sumida and Glycine are at each other's throats. As our Iris and Kukriku. Erika and Sakura try to be the mediators, but Sakura really isn't helping with her jealous bullshit either. Well, the party's a bust and everyone hates each other. Great job. Sakura and Erika, for their part, cleared up their misunderstandings with each other, but Glycine, Sumire, Iris, and Kukriko will require a bit more convincing. Sakura suggests that, instead of empty apologies, perhaps they could find a way to prove themselves to each other and come to an understanding that way. Grandmère later agrees with this idea, and lets Ogami have the night off from work to scour the neighborhood for ideas, during which Erika hands him a flyer for a dance contest which is to be held at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Ogami gathers everyone up the following day to announce his plan to have everyone compete in the dance contest together, realizing only too late he's done nothing but stoke the flames of their rivalry. The day of the contest arrives, and the Paris Flower Division take to the stage with a French can-can. <laughs> The Tokyo Trio follow up with a can can of their own, and though they don't have the budget for their own FMV, the Paris team are nonetheless awestruck by their performance. Just then, the heel snaps off of Iris's shoe. And without missing a beat, Sumire and Sakura form a barrier between Iris and the audience, blocking her from sight as she slips off her busted shoes. In that moment, they succinctly display the teamwork the Paris Flower Division had been so crucially lacking, forcing even Glycine to admit defeat. However, 
The true victor is up to the judges to decide. And before the winners can be called, the party gets crashed by Sizo and Piton, here to ruin everyone's good time. Sakura, Sumire, and Iris take charge of evacuating the citizenry, while Ogami and the rest rush back to Les Chat Noir to suit up and move out, ready to put into practice what they've just learned. The Paris Flower Division arrives on the scene, and though the two villains don't take them seriously at first, they head into battle with newfound confidence nonetheless. This is yet another battle against the stronger enemy types, but thankfully, nobody's run off on their own, so you don't start in nearly as vulnerable a position. Still though, these guys can take a hell of a beating before going down. And to make matters worse, reinforcements keep coming from the elevators at each corner of the platform. Thankfully, after two full turns... Sakura and Sumire help mop up the units on the field, reducing them to a mere 1 HP while Iris gives the team a full heal. Sakura then asks which of the two phantoms the Tokyo Flower Division should take care of. Considering how much of a pain Piton's gimmick can be, we're gonna fight Sizo ourselves, who reveals he's got an ace up his sleeve. The tower's been rigged with explosives and is set to blow, but before he can flip the switch, the Paris crew coordinate an attack knocking the detonator out of Sizo's hands and destroying it. Now that they've proven they understand what real teamwork is, it's time to put that knowledge to use by beating the boss. The big difference with Sizo's fight this time is that he now has an impenetrable shield that blocks all attacks from the front. However, he's still vulnerable from the back and sides, so just flank him and beat his ass while keeping the reinforcements at bay. And before long, Big Chungus here finally bites it for good just as the Tokyo Flower Division finishes off Piton on their own. Thus, the two reviews save the day together. And after we fast forward a little bit, we finally find out who the winners of the dance contest are. Lo and behold, it's a tie between the two teams. With that somewhat heavy-handed metaphor out of the way, it's time for Sakura, Sumire, and Iris to return home. But, I mean, come on, you saw the intro. The familiar faces aren't stopping there. Chapter 8 begins with the celebratory mood winding down as the Paris Combat Review admit the uncomfortable truth. They would have lost AGAIN were it not for the assistance of the Imperial Combat Review. They all decide they need to get stronger. And what luck, Grandmère has already arranged a visit from a team of special coaches whom Ogami is to greet at the Place du Tertre. Upon getting there, he gets a text saying they got lost, and so he wanders the neighborhood looking for them. He'll periodically get updates sent to him, but you can choose to ignore all that to go dick around with your buds. Or, starting from this chapter, if you linked your Dreamcast Sakura War save data, you'll have the ability to call the Grand Imperial Theater back in Tokyo via the Kinematron. At any rate, if you waste too much time, Ogami will eventually be told to go back to Place du Tertre to look for the coaches there. He arrives just in time to find Erika letting her melons spill out in broad daylight. Ogami catches her before she loses control and hurts herself, and as the two recover from their tumble, they're greeted by a komuso, a type of Zen Buddhist monk famous for concealing their face and playing a wooden flute in exchange for alms. Before Ogami can make sense of this turn of events, he hears a familiar voice. That's right, this time around, Ogami is finally reunited with Maria, Kanna under the komuso getup, and These three are none other than the special coaches Grandmère was referring to. How did they make the month-long boat trip in a matter of days? Shut up, that's how. They waste no time whipping the Paris crew into shape over the course of several days. But despite her best efforts, Erica fails all their training exercises. Every. Single. One of them. However, our three coaches don't seem to bear her any ill will. Instead, Maria suggests that Erica has yet to fully awaken the spirit power within her. With the training over and done with, Ogami gets to hang out with each visiting member of the Imperial Combat Review. But alas, the time eventually comes for them to go back home. No! 
Erica, meanwhile, begins to worry that she's a burden to the team, and stops showing up for work. A few days pass, and the others have grown worried about Erica's absence, before Mel and C burst in to report a suspicious person lurking outside. Ogami goes out to confront the mystery man, who turns out to just be Father Renault, with Erica in tow. He asks to speak to Ogami in private, where he confides to him that Erica doesn't actually work for the monastery, hasn't for at least half a year. Her well-intentioned blunderings been causing trouble since well before Ogami even arrived, and enough is enough. After putting up with her quirky anime girl antics all this time, Renault's finally hit his limit. Erika's only stuck around due to a wild misunderstanding. He tells Ogami to tell her not to return to the monastery. But that won't be necessary, because Erika overheard the whole conversation. Just as Ogami realizes she's there, she runs outside and into the pouring rain. The gang are all worried sick about her, and so they decide to split up and go look for her. Yes, even Lobelia. Even if she's trying really hard to hide her concern. Ogami eventually finds Erika at the bridge overlooking the river. And it's fair to say that she's not taking the news well. The cold rain then finally takes its toll on her, as she comes down with a fever, leaving Ogami with no other choice than to bring her to his apartment. After a hot shower and a pep talk, the two turn in for the night. However, Erika, unable to fall asleep, takes the opportunity to spill her guts to Ogami. Once she eventually does fall asleep, her whole body starts to glow. Maria's theory may very well have been right. The night only gets weirder as Ogami is once again visited in his dreams by the same clown as before, asking more cryptic questions. Alas, waking up proves to be no respite either, as Erika greets him in a most peculiar way. Erica, being such a sweetheart, treats us to not only a show, but breakfast as well. Or at least, an assortment of vaguely breakfast-like substances. Ogami chokes all the biohazards down and tells Erica it's time to head back to Les Chat Noir. But alas, some hesitation remains. The decision gets made for her though, as Ogami gets a message saying the theater is under attack. The two run outside, only to find the others waiting there for them. The message was just a ruse to get Erica to come back. And after all of them take turns telling her how much she meant to them, Erika decides to return to Nishet Noir after all. It's then that Ogami gets another message, saying the theater is under attack. For real this time! Indeed, Galmar and his phantom cronies have finally ascertained the location of the Paris Combat Review's headquarters. Nadel's broken through Nishet Noir's defenses and has begun her assault on the building itself. As perfect of an opportunity as this is to show off the fruits of their training, the team's still worried that their Kobu aren't up to snuff, and Grandmère, who apparently lives for these kinds of dramatic reveals, tells us she's got an ace up her sleeve. Behold, the Kobu F2. Jean the head mechanic explains that they spruced up the old Kobu F units by following schematics provided by Koran declaring the Kobu F2 the fruit of their combined power. Not to harp on it or anything, but I'm just saying, does your best girl consistently save the asses of everyone on the team? Now that we're all kitted out with new gear, Nadel's in for a rude awakening. The aim of this battle is to protect Les Chat Noir from any further harm. All we've got left is this one piddly defense barrier, and once it's destroyed, game over. Nadel's lurking about a block away, but, this being Montmartre, 
that means we've got to climb a buttload of narrow stairways. So be careful not to block off any of your teammates. Even the ones who should rightfully be able to jump. Lack of acrobatics aside, the Kolbu F2 are a cut above from the older models, and everyone makes quick work of the enemy hordes. Everyone, that is, except Erica. The first time you see her action gauge might give you some pause, because boy, this girl is struggling. Despite everything, Erica's still got a personal crisis to work through. Once you get to Nadelle, there's no new gimmicks here, you just have to account for her absurd range within the narrow confines of the map. Shield and guard accordingly, and you ought to be fine. With Nadelle down and a job well done, everyone starts to head back, before Gorbeau decides to rain on our parade. As he observed the battle from afar, he noticed that Erica has been falling behind, and thus he decides to take out the weakest link. One by one, the Flower Division falls as they try to protect Erica, who is powerless to help. Gorbo takes aim to destroy the theater, when suddenly... Erica's prayers have been answered, and her latent spirit power has finally been unlocked. What's more, her demeanor has changed entirely, as though she were possessed by a divine force. Wait, Ayame? Is that you? Quick, suck on my fingies if it's really you! Yeah. At any rate, thanks to a little divine intervention, the tides have finally turned in our favor. Gorbo regains his composure and begins his counterattack, shrouding the battlefield in darkness. The game expects us to have to rely on the targeting functions to figure out where the enemy is lurking, and I'm willing to concede this may have been a genuine impediment on your average CRT display, but on modern LCD displays, I can't say I'm feeling particularly challenged here. Darkness aside, there's also these summoners now, which constantly spit out enemies, but really, you're all so jacked at this point that it hardly even matters. The gang grounds Skullbull for good, and with the day finally saved, Erica snaps back to her normal self. We get our standard victory pose, followed by Erica formally moving into Le Chat Noir's attic, as Father Renault swings by to try to clear the air, saying Erica's free to visit the monastery whenever she likes. Meanwhile, Koran keeps collecting dubs, because thanks to one of her inventions, the team within the theater have managed to track down the likely location of the Phantom's lair, Notre Dame de Paris. Or, er, uh, Notre Dome. Guess even Koran needs spell checks sometimes. The team is now on standby as the preparations are made for a final assault on the enemy, and they're all raring to go. All of them, except Erica who's feeling just a tad freaked out about the explosive power she had just experienced. On that note, we enter Chapter 9, as we observe the aftermath of a failed military attack on Île de la Cité, the island in the Seine on which Notre Dame is situated. The Paris Combat Review is our final hope. The entirety of Paris has been evacuated, with a massive imminent earthquake being given as a cover for the true reason. Ogami and the others are tasked with checking the neighborhood for any stragglers, during which Ogami can share some intimate moments with his squadmates before the final battle. The city is eerily silent, but that silence is soon pierced by the ringing of the bells of Notre Dame. Ogami scrambles to a nearby rooftop just in time to see what the enemies got up their sleeve. Ha! 
に寄ってる気だ。Much like Kyogoku before him, g a d a m a l s got a flying fortress of his very own, named Obscur. e He reveals to Leon that the display he just put on was but a fraction of its full power, and that come sunrise, it'll have gathered enough power to wipe Paris off the map. Back at Les Chat Noirs, the review assesses the damage done to the city. Ogami decides they need to gather some intel, lest they rush into the enemy's hands unprepared. And then. So n o t o r i des! Johon s h u s h a totem t a i s e t e s Hmm, w a k a t e m a s ne? Are you really surprised at this point? Orihime and Reni burst in with some of the very intel Ogami needs, telling him all about Obscure. You see, Orihime and Reni were called in to act as reconnaissance. And because k a l m a l decided to blab about his master plan out in the open, they caught the whole thing in 4K via the power of lip reading. However, the two declare they still need to dig more dirt, so they'll be going back after a brief rest. You can choose to pal around with them while they're on their break, but either way, Ogami will eventually opt to take a nap while waiting for the two to report back. During this, he's visited once again by that damn clown. Aren't you going to say hello? Who keeps talking in vagaries before showing him a vision of Paris' s destruction. After Ogami awakes in a cold sweat, Grandmère pulls him aside for a private chat. She wants Ogami to pick one of the Flower Division members to act as his vice captain, both to assist in this battle and to take over for him following his inevitable return to Japan. With all that said, she presents him with the candidates. The three members who share the highest trust level with him. That's right, we finally reach the point where we get to pick our love interest. I gotta say though, I found the framing of it pretty weird the first time I encountered it. Like, it's one thing to have the choice be who do you take out for New Year's or who do you want to star in the Christmas play? Those are relatively low stakes. Your emotional connection is all that really matters. Here, the gravity of the choice should really outweigh whatever personal feelings you might have. You have to pick the right person for the job. This is a choice that would have consequences for both the mission and the safety of Paris going forward. Do you really want to go with nepotism here? As I molded over, though, I came to realize that all the potential candidates have their profound flaws that make it impossible to have one correct logical choice. Erika is an airhead who's often forgetful and clumsy. l i s i n is confrontational and quick to fly off the handle. Kukriko is a literal child who needs more maturing. Lobelia is an unrepentant criminal with a profound disdain for the rules. And Hanabi's meek to the point of being kind of a doormat. No one of them is better suited for the job than the others, so at that point, the only correct choice is, well, the one whom you personally trust the most. It's a neat twist on the usual formula, adding extra gravity to your choice while still allowing you to go with your heart and not be wrong for doing so. Well, except for picking Kokriko. That's wrong. Don't do that. As if I haven't made this abundantly clear already, I'm picking Erika. And I must stress, this is only because the game is forcing my hand, I swear! Ogami pulls Erika outside to tell her the news in private. And despite some initial reservations, which, honestly, yeah, understandable, she comes to both understand and welcome his decision, asking him to stay by her side forever. Remember, Ogami's heading back to Japan sometime after this, so at this point, we have the option of letting her down gently or lying to her face. And as they say, honesty is the best policy. Their tender moment is interrupted by the portable Kinematron. 
telling them that Orihime and Reni have finally gotten in touch. They've confirmed the exact location of the enemy base and have decided to continue investigating, despite Ogami's protests. With the enemy stronghold pinpointed, it's time to begin the final assault, with only an hour to go before sunrise. The game makes a very flashy entrance upon arriving at Ile de la Cité, but Léon doesn't seem particularly impressed. He reveals he's got himself a couple of hostages, Orihime and Rani. Can't leave those two alone for even five minutes before they get captured, I swear. Not that we can blame them, though, because the Flower Division immediately gets imprisoned themselves, trapped behind a wall of pure demonic energy. Leon claims there's no escape from this prison, only for the barely conscious Orihime and Reni to immediately clown on him by telling the gang how to break out. The wall can only be destroyed by waiting for the traveling beam of light to make a pit stop in each tower and attacking said tower in that instant. Unfortunately, that means once you get into position, you have to wait as the beam slowly makes its way around, but hey, no rush or anything. Otherwise, simply touching the barrier causes damage, but enemies can freely walk through it, which makes all the enemy spawners just barely outside the barrier a bit of a nuisance. Once all the towers are down, Nil makes Ogami a deal. If he alone lays down his arms, he'll let them go. Well shit, I don't see a reason not to trust this guy, so sure, let's go for it. Just as Leon gets ready to beat him into the dirt... Oh hey, you're still here! Kayama, being the bro that he is, rescues Orihime and Reni, robbing Leon of his hostages, and enabling us to fight without holding anything back. The back of the map is now littered with enemy spawners, and though the enemies don't do too much damage, they won't stop spawning every turn, so have a few characters hang back and deal with those while your heaviest hitters focus on Leon. Once they've sent the lion back to Oz, Ogami and co make their way underground, just in time for Gunmouth to summon Obscur. They're all teleported along with the ship into the Parisian skies, as it tries to absorb the last bit of power it needs. The charging will be complete once the cathedral's bells have rung five times, so it's a race against time. The area between you and the boss is littered with these funky little turrets, with the red ones shooting fireballs with big areas of effect, and the blue ones firing more concentrated shots with a smaller radius that sap your super meter instead of your health. Genmar himself, meanwhile, is surrounded by a bunch of these independently moving tentacles that will wrap up your units and attack anyone who's already been wrapped. Once you make your way past all that, you can finally wail on this dude, but you may have noticed that, oddly enough, the bells haven't rung even once yet. To ruin the illusion for a second, I lied. The bells don't actually indicate a time limit. Instead, they ring whenever Ken Mal's health goes below certain thresholds, and you actually have all the time in the world before that final fifth bell rings. We're operating by DBZ rules here. Once he's had his ass thoroughly kicked, Gadmouth screams that he's not owned and tries to take the whole city with him in a fiery explosion. He puts up a barrier to protect himself, but Ogami, with a little help from his friends, makes it through, stopping the detonation as Squidward goes up in smoke. Having saved the city from total annihilation, the Paris Combat Review greet the dawn and share one final victory pose all together, as Orihime, Reni, and Kayama watch from afar. The evacuees return to the city, the two Tokyo members take to the stage to celebrate, and Ogami and Erika have a comical lover's spat. All's well that ends well. Oh hey, check out what I found in the case, a third disc. We enter chapter 10 with a very colorful loose end still dangling about, who comes once more to haunt Ogami's dreams. The jester proceeds to drop a bombshell on him. His teammates all share the same blood as the phantoms they've just finished fighting. The blood of the Parisi. Ogami has no clue what any of that means, but the clown's not in an answering mood. The next morning, as Ogami leaves to get breakfast, he runs into his love interest, in our case Erika, and makes plans to meet with her later that night. 
The time comes, and Ogami and Erika go to what appears to me to be the area just outside of the Sacred Heart Basilica, from where they can see the entirety of Paris down below. Erika then asks Ogami a very important question, whether he has a special someone back in Tokyo. As much as I like Erika, Koran still got her beat, so we put her down gently, and, uh, she doesn't take it well. In actuality, it's that damn clown once again, this time possessing Erika and speaking to us through her. Once Erika wakes up and regains control, oblivious to what just happened, the ground starts violently shaking. They look down at the city, only to find that Paris is burning. This destruction is being caused by some mysterious form of plant life, the origin of which has been traced back to Notre Dame. Looks like we weren't thorough enough for our last time there, and so we set out once more to clean up. What the team finds when they get there is... Somehow, Kelma returned. However, he's in rough shape and doesn't even know what's going on. He's just here to be a hater. Hating is all that's keeping him going. There's a massive ravine in the middle of Ile de la Cité, with Calmar on one side and a set of ticking time bombs on the other. You have to split the party in two, with one half attacking Calmar and the other dealing with the bombs. Unlike the last mission, this time limit is for real, and it's a strict one. The bombs will go from blue to green to red each turn and upon reaching red, they will detonate the next turn, resulting in a game over. The only thing you can do is use the heal command on the bombs to reset them to blue, at which point the cycle will start over. Mountain mode is a must for this mission, as it's the mode with the cheapest cost for healing, and you'll want to maximize the amount of pips you have for moving between the bombs. There are four bombs and only three team members on that side, meaning they'll have to run around and keep spitting the proverbial plates, all while these nasty stumps attack them for significant damage on top of poisoning them, until Calmar is finally defeated. Even though the battle's been won, the plants remain, and soon enough, they begin to glow. The light emitting from them solidifies into the form of the jester from Ogami's dreams, finally appearing in the flesh and introducing themselves as Salu. Salu wastes no time, explaining that the island they're standing upon Ile de la Cité was once lush and verdant, occupied by a people who lived in harmony with nature, the Parisi. In real life, the Parisi, the namesake of the city of Paris itself, were a Gallic tribe that lived along the Seine. Just as Sérieux goes on to explain, they were eventually conquered by the Romans. But in the Sakura Wars timeline, the lingering grudge of the Parisi eventually manifested as the Phantoms to attack the city and exact their revenge. By defeating the Phantoms, the Flower Division had unwittingly released their power, which in turn made these mysterious plants grow. During this explanation, the girls all feel a strange familiarity with the images they're being shown, which turn out to be the memories of their ancestors. What Sedu had said in the dream was true. All the girls in the Paris Combat Review's Flower Division are the descendants of the Parisi. The backs of each of their hands begin to glow with the mysterious symbol, which Sadiru explains is proof of their shared lineage. Ogami is incredulous, but the girls innately realize it's the truth. Salu, with the souls of the defeated phantoms in hand, begins to summon what they call the Great Oak. But when Ogami tries to stop it, the girls refuse to follow his orders. The only thing Ogami can get them to do is run, as the Great Oak bursts forth from Notre Dame. Roots of the Great Oak are running amok throughout Paris. Despite Grandmère's insistence, the girls have completely lost the will to fight after discovering the truth of their ancestry. Before long, the rampaging Roots make their way to the Chat Noir, and it's time to evacuate. 
There's a new model of the Eclair waiting for us, the Eclair 4. And though the routes may be tough, this train's got hands. Literally. The routes course through the rail tunnels in dogged pursuit, and soon shoot out mysterious objects that begin to attack the train. Even with the threat of the train's destruction and their own deaths, the girls are loath to fight, forcing Ogami to deploy alone. However, before he moves out, his vice captain, in our case Erika, powers through her hesitation and decides to follow him after all. On top of the train, we come face to face with our attackers, these Ultraman Kaiju looking motherfuckers called Calamite. They're attacking the steam units atop the train, and if three or more of those are destroyed, the train will explode. The steam units are thankfully pretty sturdy, but some of these jerks can hit hard, so we still ought to move quick. After defeating two full waves of these weirdos, Erika gets knocked to the back of the train. Ogami catches her just in time before she can fall off, but they're now at the mercy of the third wave. The odds look daunting, but as they begin to close in... The rest of the crews finally come around, having chosen their friends over their lineage. The fully assembled team make quick work of the Calamite, but before the train is cleared of the tunnel, a cluster of oncoming routes destroys the steam units, triggering a massive explosion. When Ogami comes to, he finds Erika at his side, along with a massive crater where the train presumably used to be. The others are nowhere to be found. The two spend the night at a nearby park as they await contact from the rest of the team, and eventually get back to talking about Ogami's squeeze back home. Erika's made up her mind that she wants to be Ogami's Parisian lover, to be his girlfriend even if only until he goes back home. Ogami agrees to these terms, and there is absolutely zero way that this will come back to bite him in the ass. However, the following morning, Ogami wakes up just in time to catch Erika attempting to leave on her own. She tells him she's going to attempt to sacrifice herself to stop the Great Oak, reasoning that the Parisi blood within her will allow her to do so. Ogami, who just got through a whole game about how much mortal sacrifice sucks, is not a big fan of this plan, and he convinces Erika they'll find some other way. Just then, they finally get a transmission on the portable Kinematron. Even after the end, hope lies in our hands. We'll be waiting at L'Arc de Triomphe, Grand Mer. They go there to find the others miraculously alive. When asked how the hell they managed to pull that one off, they explain they were saved, and their savior was none other than Ambassador Sakobizu. Or, should I say, Norimichi Sakobizu, head of the Paris Combat Review's Arc de Triomphe branch. Just like how the Imperial Combat Reviews got their Hanayashiki branch, the Paris Combat Reviews got a whole secret facility of its own. With fortune finally smiling upon us, we enter the final chapter. The roots of the Great Oak have ravaged the city, and Mel reports that if this continues, Paris will be completely overrun by sundown. The situation looks bleak, but thankfully we've discovered the likely location of the tree's core. All we need to do is destroy it. This, of course, raises a valid question. How the hell are we going to get there? Grand all too happy to do one last dramatic reveal, shows off the Arc de Triomphe branch's secret weapon. Behold, the Revolver Cannon. Rather than offense, this bad boy's been built to transport the Flower Division long distances in an extremely short amount of time with Sakumizu claiming it could send them anywhere in Europe in an instant. If it were complete. As it stands, it's still a work in progress, and we've got no choice but to be the guinea pigs. Ogami, understandably, has some concerns, but Grandmel tells him that this is gonna be a one-way trip anyway. That everyone involved is probably going to die. This moment right here showcases the biggest difference between her and Yoneta. Whereas Yoneta is racked with guilt over having to send the girls out to battle over and over again, Grandmer has a more, shall we say, pragmatic attitude. No sacrifice is too big for the greater good. Suck it up, kid. This is war. She tells Ogami to give the order to move out, but Ogami, 
being a big proponent of the anti-sacrifice agenda, flatly refuses. Nobody's dying on his watch. The rest of the team enthusiastically agrees, and Calmel quietly concedes with a mea culpa. With the plan revised and settled, we get our title drop, as Operation Is Paris Burning is a go. For a quick bit of background, most of the subtitles used for the classic Sakura War series were taken from the poems of Meiji and Taisho era feminist poet Akiko Yosano. Thou shalt not die, in hot blood, because I have you, all from her. Meanwhile, this game's subtitle, Is Paris Burning, is from the 1965 book of the same name by Larry Collins and Dominique Lapierre. As for where the book got its title from, don't worry about it. And as for what Akiko Yosano would go on to write in the Showa era, don't worry about it. Preparations for the launch are nearly complete as Ogami gazes at the devastated city from atop L'Arc de Triomphe. He's soon joined by Erika, who seems bothered by something. She just can't shake the feeling that she'll never see Ogami again after this. Ogami attempts to comfort her, but the intimate moment is cut short. The roots of the Great Oak know where we are and are on the attack. With not a moment to spare, it's time for launch. Not quite the ludicrous spectacle as the Mikasa launch sequence from past entries, but still, hey for effort. Ogami emerges from his bullet pod, only to find himself all on his own. He has no choice but to fight the enemy hordes alone as he searches for the others. The first mission of this chapter has you going from room to room by reaching the netted walls in the back and destroying them to progress. As you make your way through, you'll find the other members of the Flower Division one by one. In our case, Glycine here has made it out on her own, but two of the others, Lobelia and Kukiko, are still in their pods, trapped inside by the overgrowth, so they'll need to be cut out before you can progress. All the while, the mission is intercut with scenes from throughout the city, showing all the other characters doing whatever they can to help combat the crisis, as they pray for the success of the review. Once the three members have been gathered, they step outside to climb down to the lower levels of the tree and reach the core thus starting the second mission. The map here is absolutely lousy with enemies, and the team immediately finds Hanabi trying to fend them all off. To make matters worse, the map's also littered with these turret-like stumps and these landmine-like pustules, so you'll have to proceed with extra caution. However, if this is your second time playing through the game, assuming you've been spending your time wisely and increasing your trust with both your teammates and the civilians, you'll finally reach Ogami's maximum level around this point, which not only gives him a permanent plus 10 to both attack and defense, but also grants him access to his ultimate move. It deals huge damage and has a stupidly massive range that ignores elevation differences, making it ideal for this map. Plus, it just looks cool as hell, though I'm not going to show it here. Let it be an incentive for you to grab a New Game Plus save off the internet and play through the game yourselves once you're done watching this video. Anyway, once you reach the entryway at the bottom of the platforms, 
Mission 2 will end and you'll transition right into Mission 3, where we come face to face once more with Salu. They try once more to dissuade the girls while reminding them of their heritage, but they're not having any of it anymore. Thus, the final boss fight begins. Though, I can't help but feel like we're forgetting something. Eh, I'm sure it's fine. The gimmick of this first phase is that, once Seru's mech has reached a set amount of damage, it will split into multiple smaller mechs. But only one of them, the yellow one, is the real one. Don't send all your units out at once to fight it though, because once you defeat it, the full-sized mech will reform at the same location it was at before it split. So keep some units parked in the general vicinity to save yourself the trip and the pips. Once you've beaten Seru, they make a shocking revelation. Their defeat was all part of the plan. I'm bleeding, making me the victor. Remember, the souls of the Parisi are the source of the Great Oak's power, and with Seru's defeat, we've inadvertently awakened its core, named Dernier, and begun the second phase. Dernier likes to stay in one place, but it has a massive attack range and deals a staggering amount of damage. Even when you're guarding, it stings something fierce. Once you've brought it down to about half health, Kukriko makes a shocking discovery. Erika's battered pod is lying in this room, with Erika herself nowhere to be found. Ogami, remembering what Erika told him atop Lac de Triomphe just before they left, assumes the worst, collapsing to the ground in grief. Dernier then unleashes a volley of attacks, and just as Ogami is about to get hit, Erika is safe and sound, and at long last joins us for the final battle. Dernier is healed back up to full health, but so are you, so just dump your supers on it while healing is needed. Once Dernier's health has been drained, it shatters the floor beneath the flower division, sending them tumbling through the darkness, only for them to pop out in... space? It's then revealed that we've basically been fighting Dernier's hat this whole time, as we bear witness to its final form, and... Wood. This battle takes place atop a giant circular platform, a magic circle overlaid with the mark of the Parisi, with the city of Paris far, far below. During its turns, Dernier will move along the edges of the platform before unleashing a brutal attack chain or super move on your party. However, much like the final boss of Sakura Wars 2, It'll be in your best interest to not guard against the oncoming damage and not use the shield command. Instead, you'll want to take the full brunt of its attack in order to rapidly gain your super meter back. That way you can unleash a steady and consistent stream of super attacks. To make this a lot easier on yourself, switch to win mode so you get a good balance between affordable healing and affordable charging. Even though at this point you'll have access to your exclusive team attack with your love interest, if you picked Erika like I did, you'll probably want to avoid using that, instead opting to use her usual healing super as needed instead. After we've depleted Dania's health again, the illusion of space is dispelled, as the giant naked tree lady hand thing comes crashing down to the ground. Take a deep breath, because we've finally reached the final phase. You'll want to repeat the same damage tanking strategy as the last phase, dumping as many supers as you can on the boss. However, this time around, Dernier is totally stationary and instead drops the circular platform from before on top of the field and uses it to lift your units up, mix around their positions off screen, then drop them back down before beginning its devastating assault. So long as you're on top of your healing and charging though, you'll make it through okay. And eventually, when the boss's health bar hits zero, The battle is finally over, and though they had some close scrapes, 
Everyone in the flower division lives to see another day. No sacrifice is required. However, despite seeing them literally crumble to dust in that last cutscene, Kill Jester. Looks like Salu's not through with us yet. I guess being an incorporeal ghost clan lets you do that. Sedu wants to know why Ogami and the others fought as hard as they did to protect Paris. Declaring cities to be inherently evil blights on nature. In turn, Ogami and Erika proclaim that cities, being human creations, where humans live and start families, are a part of nature as well. Sedu remains unconvinced, at which point the girls, reasoning that their connection to the Parisi means the Great Oak would be receptive to their pleas, begin to pray. Sedu becomes enveloped in light, and they finally come to understand what the girls meant before fading away completely. So too does the Great Oak, making all the pre-existing plant life around it prosper as it disappears. With that, the city is finally safe, and Operation Is Paris Burning is a success. おかえり。大神一郎以下 a month passes, and Paris is on the mend following all the chaos. The Flower Division takes a long overdue vacation, and bookends this story by visiting the expo from the start of the game. Erika pulls Ogami aside to ask him if he wants to spend some time alone, leading right into her ending scene. Oi, Erika kun! え、そこで黒黒しているムシオガミさんはちょっとお間抜けそうに見えますが、実はこのパリを守ってくれた大恩人なんです。詳しくは言えないんですけど、この間の大事件の時に命をかけてこのパリを救ってくれたんです。イエ
楽しい時間をありがとうございました。私は大神さんと出会えて本当に良かったと思っています。私はきっとこれからも土地だけど明るさを忘れずに元気にパリを守っていくつもりです。もちろんシャノワールの踊り子としても頑張ります。ですから大
The main strategy behind combat lies in how far you're willing to push your combo, as the animation for each successive hit gets longer and longer, leaving you open to attacks, with the finishing blow in particular being very unsafe. I haven't been able to find cancels or any other type of hidden tech either. Just smack the A button, but not too much. It's a very old-school arcade type of action gameplay, where instead of focusing on mastering a vast arsenal of techniques, it's more about optimization of a limited moveset. Never underestimate the power of a proper pogo. Ultimately, this mode's a nice diversion, a neat little toy to mess around with once you've beaten the main game. But it's also the first real attempt at action combat in the main series, well before the PS4 game and even before Sakura Wars 5 Episode 0 on PS2. It might not be the most engaging gameplay in the world, but it's an interesting experiment, a tiny glimpse into the future, even if those who played it back in 2001 didn't know it at the time. Next, if you go visit any of the girls, you'll get the option to either replay their minigame from the main game or talk to them about dates. You're then presented with two options, and if you select the first option, make sure you've got enough free space on your VMU because you'll be downloading the standalone VMU minigame, A Couple in Paris. The idea here is you take your VMU with you as you go about your day, periodically checking in on your so-called date. Sometimes she has things to say, sometimes she doesn't. Every now and then she'll ask you a question, and the answer you pick will affect your trust level, which is indicated by these hearts you can check via the options menu. Maxing out the affection of all the characters in their couple and Paris minigames will unlock a special bonus CG in the gallery, which is cool and all, but that's not what I'm interested in. No, for me, the meat of this minigame lies in its pair card minigame. That's right, minigames within minigames. It's fairly basic, you and your date draw an identical hand of cards and take turns taking one of the other player's cards. The player then discards the pairs they form, and whoever gets rid of all their cards first wins. The twist is that one player has an extra Joker card, which can't be paired with anything, so the other player has to be careful and avoid pulling it. It's a simple time waster, as was typical of VMU minigames, but winning these card games earns you chips. Then, by slotting the VMU back into your Dreamcast controller, re-entering the Elegant Day mode, talking to the relevant character and selecting Talk About a Previous Date, the game will read your couple in Paris data and withdraw all the chips from it. What do you even do with all these chips? Why, you gamble, of course. Which brings us to our next stop, Casino Wars. You get the opportunity to play both blackjack and poker during Chapter 7 of the main game, but in this mode, you get to play either game as much as you want. It's pretty basic stuff at first. You have to be eight opponents in a row, back to back, at one of the two card games. You start each match of poker with 100 chips, and each match of blackjack with 500 chips. But you don't get to keep these chips, and you don't get to use your chips from the VMU minigame either, at least not yet. Each match goes on for 10 rounds, and whoever has the most chips at the end wins. Beating all the opponents in either of the two card games will unlock Casino Wars 2. This time, you can challenge whoever you want to either blackjack or poker, with the same 10 round structure, from a selection of 16 total challengers, heroes and villains alike, even including Kayama and Saru. Defeat them all and you'll unlock the final form of this mode, Casino Wars 3. Casino Wars 1 and 2 both have multiple areas you're not allowed to go to, while Casino Wars 3 grants you full access to the rest of the facility, letting you play two additional games, roulette and slots, as well as visit the salon and the prize counter. Oh, you thought we were done with exclusive minigames after Kobu Knuckle, huh? At this point, you also finally get to keep whatever chips you earn, as well as use the chips withdrawn from the Couple in Paris VMU minigame. And what better way to spend your newfound spoils than with our two new game types? You have your basic roulette table and your basic assortment of slot machines, but both of these also come with special varieties. For roulette, there's the Sakura table, which applies random modifiers to the current round, such as reducing the number of possible spaces or triggering a multiball. The slots, meanwhile, include special machines with a whole-ass board game attached to them. The amount of credit you put into the machine determines how many spaces your little Ogami can move, and the spot he lands on can trigger bonuses for the slots themselves, such as reward multipliers or getting to move extra spaces on the board, though you do also run the risk of getting sent all the way back to the start. There's no endpoint to these board games, you just go around forever trying to land on the good spaces whenever you can. 
Of all the available games, the board game slots are probably the best long-term way of racking up chips, thanks to the abundance of multipliers, but there is still one more, less active way of earning income. Head on over to the lounge and you'll get to talk to any of the Flower Division members of your choice, who will offer to gamble on your behalf, with each of them having their own gambling styles. You can give them up to half of your total chips and let them go to town. As you gamble on your own, you can look down at the VMU and your controller to see how your selected partner is doing on their end, with an animation playing whenever they win, as well as whenever they lose. Whenever you've had enough, head back to the lounge to collect your proxy earnings. Or whatever's left, since it's not a guarantee you'll actually make a profit like this. Gambling is still gambling, after all. After playing a bunch of games in the casino and a bunch of pair card in the VMU minigame, you'll probably have quite the stack of chips at your disposal, which you can exchange for unlockables at the prize booth. You can buy whatever bromides you missed out on in the main game, alternate costumes for the flower division when playing blackjack or poker, bonus tracks for the music player, model viewers for all the mechs, etc. By the way, did you know they have unique models for all the Kobu Kai, including ones that never actually appear anywhere in this game, nor in any other game in the series? What the hell is that about? How does this game have so much stuff? There is one type of unlockable here that really catches my eye, though. The Drama Download Password Cards. The Dreamcast was a trailblazing pioneer in the realm of downloadable content on consoles. So, naturally, Socket of Wars 3 got in on the action as well. You know, because the game wasn't massive enough as it is already. It was the first game in the mainline series to feature downloadable content, and would be the only one until the soft reboot on PS4. These were referred to as drama downloads, most of which were bonus episodes and vignettes. While some of them were small, like little more than a minute long, others were surprisingly robust, lasting up to an hour and featuring multiple different endings. The shorter ones were mostly free, requiring the aforementioned password cards from the casino to access. The rest, meanwhile, didn't need password cards, but had to be purchased with the paid Dorimu currency used by Isao.net the Japanese equivalent of the SegaNet and Dream Arena web services for the Dreamcast. Yeah, some of you might be too young to remember this, but there was a time when nearly every gaming platform forced you to purchase arbitrary amounts of Monopoly money before you could exchange them for the thing you actually wanted to buy. Like, imagine if you had to use V-Bucks to buy shit off the Nintendo eShop. Even now, the phrase Microsoft points triggers my gag reflex. One dorimu equaled about one yen, and the paid drama downloads ranged in price from 200 to 300 dorimu, which in US dollars at the time would have been around 150 to 230. However, it was not long for this world, as the distribution of paid downloadable content for the game was terminated on March 22nd, 2002. Because they included it all with Sakura Wars 4, released one day earlier. Every copy of Sakura Wars 4 came with a bonus disc, from which you could download each and every single piece of Sakura Wars 3 DLC for free directly to your VMU. As a bonus, they took out all the requirements for password cards too, which means I just wasted a shitload of chips for nothing. What may very well have been a quick and dirty value add for the fourth game turned out to be very forward thinking in the long run as it ensured this content would remain legally accessible on its original platform for the foreseeable future, long after all the associated services went permanently offline. I'm not gonna go super in-depth with the plot of these DLCs. Well, for the ones that have plots, that is. They're not exactly intricate narratives, they're more along the lines of the kind of antics you'd see in the Hanagumi Taisen Column story modes. Plus, I'd have to go over like a zillion different endings for some of them. Much like Columns, then, I'll give a quick summary of each. To our first-time guests, an introduction to the rest of the drama downloads. This one is actually altered for the Sakura Wars 4 bonus disc, hence the 2002 date, whereas the original version originally hosted on the website is, unfortunately, seemingly lost to time. Happy Birthday! A quick vignette of the girls wishing you a happy birthday. If your real-life friend group bails on you on your birthday, rest assured, the Flower Division is always there for you. The gang's all here. A big spring commotion. Erica and C run out of Le Chat Noir in a hurry, and Mel thinks they're up to mischief. It's up to the two of you to track them down to get some answers. But for whatever reason, 
The other members of the Flower Division are all trying to stop you. Alarm clocks. Exactly what it says on the tin. You could download up to five separate alarm clocks, one for each member of the Flower Division, letting you meet the morning sun with the waifu of your choice. Fire up the DLC, set the time you want to wake up, then leave your Dreamcast and TV on overnight, until... The Sakura Wars 4 bonus disc, meanwhile, contained an additional two exclusive alarms, one for Mel and C, and the other for all the Phantoms of Paris. I don't know about you, but I can hardly get up in the morning without the lilting tones of a giant lumpy squid man. The Great Gamble. Grandmère takes Ogami to an auction to help her win a sealed letter from the late King of England, but the two lose to a shady casino owner. When said casino puts on a tournament and offers to grant a single wish as one of the prizes, Grandmère, hellbent on getting that letter, orders Ogami to compete and wish for it. Ogami then trains for the tournament by way of a minigame gauntlet before finally throwing down the chips for real. The Great Chat Noir Chase. It's a busy night at Le Chat Noir and the house is packed. However, after a certain customer upsets Napoleon the cat, Ogami and C must rally up all the help they can get to catch that kitty before it goes on a rampage and causes a catastrophe on the show floor. Paris's hottest summer. The summer heat is unbearable, but one of the review's mechanics has come up with the invention of a lifetime a steam-powered air conditioner. All he needs is a little extra money to actually build the thing, to the tune of 5,000 francs. After Kukiko demonstrates how to make money with street performances, Ogami must coordinate who performs where in order to maximize the profits and get the crew their cooler. Christmas Calendar The holiday season is upon us, and the Paris Flower Division decides to send Ogami back in Tokyo a Christmas gift, an advent calendar which forms the framing device of the rest of this DLC. Using the Dreamcast's built-in clock, every day from December 1st to the 24th, you'll unlock a little skit or vignette. Some of these are related to Christmas, while others are just slice-of-life shenanigans unrelated to the holidays. If you missed a day or two or 23, don't worry. You can view every single day you missed right up to the current day. This actually might be my favorite DLC of the whole set. You know me, I love the slice of life character moments this series provides, and this DLC just lets me knock them back in rapid succession. It's pretty terrific. Happy New Year! Another DLC utilizing the system clock, this one is primarily meant to be played on New Year's Eve, where you can enjoy the cast counting down to midnight. But that's not all. For all the other 364 days of the year, this thing's basically a sort of Chat Noir simulator. Mel and C greet you at the door, bring you to your table, and leave you to enjoy the occasional musical performances or conversation while you do something else, perhaps enjoying a drink or meal in front of your Dreamcast. There is one drawback here that kind of dampens the intended experience, though. None of these performances have vocals. The characters are supposed to be singing their themes with the lyrics and text timed with the music, but instead of this... We get this. I get why it's like this, storage limitations and all that, but the end result does feel a tad bit awkward. Okay, there. Now I'm finally, finally done talking about all the extra content tucked away in Sakura Wars 3. 
The game is stuffed to the gills with modes and features in a way no other game in the series, before or since, has gotten even remotely close to. The sheer breadth of the elegant day in Paris mode is a perfect microcosm of Sakura Wars 3 in general. It was the ultimate display of the series' power at its peak. It was big, bold, and ambitious, and the series was popular enough to warrant a budget capable of seeing all these concepts realized. That said, there's a big question still lingering after all of this, one I continue to wrestle with even now. Is it better than Sakura Wars 2? At the end of the Sakura Wars 2 video, I suggested that 3 was an even better game, and I'd still say it is, on a mechanical level. The combat is a lot more open-ended while retaining the defining mechanics from the prior games. Analog Lips is a fantastic addition, there's a shocking variety of gameplay modes, and the world is far more fleshed out, featuring more locations to visit and more characters to interact with. But is it a better story? For starters, I feel like 3 ultimately sticks the landing better in regards to the final antagonist. In 2, Kyogoku's original motive was compelling due to its real-life historical parallels, mirroring the rise of fascism in early Showa-era Japan. But eventually, it's revealed this was nothing more than a smokescreen for his real goal, which was rather poorly defined and almost immediately undermined by his own actions. Salu, meanwhile, is a lot more committed to their goal of revenge on behalf of the Parisi. On paper, it's similar to Kyogoku's true goal, but the execution and justification are handled far better. Unlike Kyogoku's flimsily justified, hastily explained fictional grievances, Salu's motive is based on actual history and raises questions about the morality of benefiting over a past atrocity you had no hand or say in, but have total cognizance of. The people currently living in Paris had nothing to do with the subjugation of the Parisi, but they still benefit from it thousands of years later. In a scenario where the victims come back to collect, is it on them to pay the price? Must they answer for the sins of the father? We even see our main cast struggle with this dilemma themselves, at one point losing the will to fight altogether. Even if you don't agree with the answer the game suggests, it's a far more compelling argument than, I just think demons are neat. On the other hand, though the Phantoms of Paris are a lot more fleshed out and memorable than the Black Hive Council in Sakura Wars 1, they don't hold a candle to the Black Oni in 2. 2 spends a lot of time developing the rapport and chemistry between its villains, whereas for the majority of 3, the Phantoms are acting independently, and even when they are finally cooperating, we barely see them play off each other. Thankfully, the failings of the antagonists don't reflect the rest of the cast. In fact, one of the big strengths of Sakura Wars 3 is just how strong all the main characters are right out the gate. I'd go so far as to say they make a stronger first impression than any of the main cast in the first two games. Okay, only most of them. But still, the cast of three is great. Erika is such a breath of fresh air as this game's poster girl, she provides such a stark contrast to Sakura in so many ways. Though she's prone to failure and not terribly intelligent, she's always ready to help those in need despite her own feelings of inadequacy. The scene 2 is a fresh take on what was in danger of becoming a tired archetype within the series, giving her a sense of duty and honor along with her status. Whereas characters like Sumide and Orihime took a while to grow on me, I had no such issues with the scene. She just needed to focus those energies in a more positive direction, is all. Meanwhile, of all the kid characters to show up in the series, Kokriko's probably my favorite. Don't get me wrong, Iris is good and all, but she always felt like the cartoon stereotype of a child, especially in the first game where her entire character hinged on the fact that she's just a kid. Kukriko, on the other hand, feels like a more fleshed out and believable person. Her youth informs her character rather than defines it. Lobelia, I already gushed about at length. All hail the crime queen. Finally, Hanabi really brings to the forefront one of the running themes of the game, of suffering in silence, of smiling through the pain. The second you see her cuddle up to a tombstone, you know she's hiding some deep hurt with that smile of hers, and it's genuinely cathartic seeing her finally begin to heal. However, I'd still say that, on the whole, 
most of the cast of the first two games still have them be, though they do have a somewhat unfair advantage. By virtue of having most of them already introduced in Sakura Wars 1, Sakura Wars 2 had more time to dedicate to developing them while also allowing its new characters more room to breathe. 3, on the other hand, has to start from scratch and dedicate a good chunk of its playtime to establishing the new setting and all the characters in it. The world is richer and more fleshed out, but it comes at the cost of getting to know those who live in it more intimately. At the risk of sounding trite, by the end of Sakura Wars 3, we know the Paris Combat Review as though they were our best friends. But by the end of 2, we've gotten to know the Imperial Combat Review as though they were family. The endings of both games are very similar, and 3 suffers for it by way of deja vu, but even putting that aside, the ending of 3 doesn't tug at my heartstrings quite like 2's ending did. My thoughts are always complicated when I try to compare these two games. It'd be kind of a cop-out to say I like them equally, but I always flip-flop over which one I like more. If Sakura Wars 2 was a fluffy bathrobe, then Sakura Wars 3 is a pair of pants fresh out of the dryer. It's arguably just as pleasant, but in different ways. Sakura Wars 3 is a phenomenal game, one of the Dreamcast's definitive works, exploiting every single feature and technological innovation the console was capable of on a scale few other games on the system could muster. It managed to sell over 220,000 copies in its first four days on the market, making it an instant hit. But alas, nothing could save the Dreamcast at that point. Of course, none of this came as a surprise to the teams over at Overworks and Red Company working on the game, and they had planned accordingly. The game's sequel, Sakura Wars 4, would see a release on the Dreamcast almost exactly a year later, a decision that created a ripple effect that would change the course of the series forever. But before we talk about that, we'll have to take another detour as we approach December 2001, which might very well have been the single busiest month in the entire history of the franchise. ずっと前に私は東京に大切な人がいるから私はパリの恋人でいいって言いましたよねあれやっぱりやめます私は大神さんの恋人になりますいつの日かエリカは大神さんのおそばに参りますそしたら今度は私を本当の恋人にしてく